Welcome back to my channel. Thank you for your support. If you haven't subscribed yet, make sure to hit that subscribe button for more exciting stories like this. Let's dive right into today's thrilling adventure. Our story commences as our main character goes grocery shopping amidst news reports about a surge in animal injuries in Z City. Citizens are advised to avoid venturing out at night, but the authorities are currently investigating the situation, so there's no need to panic. Additionally, several people in X City have contracted influenza from an unidentified virus. The media in X City will continue to provide updates on the situation. However, our protagonist, engrossed in selecting tuna cans, believes it's harmless to stock up on canned foods. While absorbed in listening to music through his earphones, a woman in the store mentions to her friend that an elderly member of the Lee family, known for their good health, suffered a sudden emergency and passed away a few days ago. The friend wonders if it was due to influenza, and the woman confirms that it was indeed the case. She adds that the old man couldn't even survive for two days. The woman also remarks to her friend about the lack of peace in the world these days. Later, our protagonist loads their groceries into their truck, meticulously checking to ensure they have packed seeds, instant meals, frozen foods, meat, daily necessities, snacks, canned food, and other items. They realize they only need to top up on diesel before heading home. Moreover, they are aware of the urgency to cook for Han Han, as they have a deer, they hunted earlier in the day to prepare. While driving home, his girlfriend calls him and inquiries about a proposal she previously made. Referring to him as Tian Ran, she asks if he has considered her suggestion. He responds by expressing his intention to find a respectable job that allows him to maintain his dignity in public. Satisfied with his response, she agrees. However, he informs his girlfriend that he won't send Lien to an orphanage. Angered, Lien tells him that she is not biologically related to him and questions why he discusses marriage if he plans to bring a child into their relationship. Nevertheless, he reaffirms that Lien is his sister and an important member of their family. This upsets his girlfriend, who questions why she should raise a child who isn't her own. Frustrated with his lack of seriousness, she suggests breaking up if he cannot commit. He agrees reluctantly and is about to say something when something unexpected appears in front of him. He swerves to avoid it, cursing and feeling startled. He realizes it is a sheep and wonders if it was a dog initially. Noticing its severe head injury, he is shocked to see it still alive with red eyes. The sheep limps away from the road and into the bushes. He silently watches it before redirecting his attention to the road, deciding to leave it behind and not report it to the traffic police. Shortly after, he reaches home and proceeds to unload the groceries from his truck. Suddenly, someone addresses him as brother, causing him to turn around and spot a little girl with two dogs approaching him. Astonished by the multitude of items he purchased, she excitedly tells him that she came to help carry them. He hands her a small bag of food, and together, they make their way towards their home. The girl informs him that she completed all the tasks he assigned her, including feeding the cows, changing their water, and tending to the crops. She also expressed her fatigue and longing for her big brother's stew to help her feel better. He agreed and suggested making a carrot and venison stew to satiate her hungry stomach. She gladly embraced the idea, and they continued their conversation, bringing a smile to his face. However, one of the dogs started grazing on the side, prompting her to affectionately tap its head and call it Xiaobai, reminding it not to eat the crops. They continued walking joyfully, noticing sheep footprints along the way, while the cow, engrossed in grazing, observed them with red eyes from its fenced enclosure. Later, she mentioned that she had never witnessed a solar eclipse before and inquired if it was true that the sky would turn completely dark, akin to the evening. Meanwhile, the radio informed them that the most remarkable total solar eclipse of the century was imminent. As promised, she enthusiastically exclaimed how delicious the stew was while eating, remarking on her big brother's improved hunting and cooking skills. He informed her that the sun wouldn't be entirely obscured but would darken, emphasizing the need for her to wear the glasses he had provided to observe it safely. The radio announced that the countdown for the eclipse would commence. When the countdown began, she pointed outside and asked him about the unfolding event. Shocked, he rose to his feet and beheld the dark blue moon outside. Once the countdown reached zero, their electricity abruptly vanished. Anxiously, she asked him about the power outage and expressed how cold it had become. In the midst of the confusion, the dog began barking incessantly, and the radio emitted an unknown, loud noise. 
Fearfully, she gestured towards something and urged her big brother to look. Startled, he emerged from their home, only to discover that it was snowing. Perplexed, she inquired about the blizzard occurring in the middle of summer. He instructed her to quickly return to the house while he locked up the cattle and sheep, assuring her of his imminent return. He told Xiaobai to stay behind and take care of Han Han, and the dog barked in agreement. Anxiously, she implored him to hurry due to the chilling weather, but he reassured her not to worry. He then called the other dog, Xiao Hei, to accompany him, and they ventured into the stormy blizzard. He questioned if everything was okay, only to be momentarily blinded by the shining dark moon in the stormy blizzard. Looking up at the radiant dark moon in the sky, he pondered its inexplicable presence. Suddenly, Xiao Hei noticed something, diverting his attention from the peculiar plants, blizzard, and sun. Xiao Hei barked at an unknown entity and leapt behind him. Startled, he evaded a charging bull that appeared behind him. Xiao Hei retaliated against the bull, causing it to turn around and flee. Realizing his compound bow should be nearby, he spotted it immediately. The bull flung Xiao Hei away, which filled him with frustration. He aimed at the bull, but he noticed a blue target light in front of him, leaving him perplexed about its origin. Nevertheless, he released the arrow, which struck the bull in the face, eliciting a painful cry. Feeling a surge of excitement, he believed the bull should be dead, only to witness it charging fiercely towards him, instilling panic. Shouting that it was still alive, he reached for more arrows, only to realize that he had run out of ammunition. The system indicated that the ammunition count was zero and there were three living beings in close proximity, momentarily confusing him. However, he quickly understood the need for prompt action. When he attempted to retrieve an arrow, he couldn't believe that he had indeed run out. Suddenly, the bull reappeared before him and struck him, sending him flying. Coughing in pain, he looked at Xiao Hei, who barked and pointed towards their house, realizing that Xiao Hei was signaling that the danger emanated from there. As the bull had undergone a mutation, Han Han was no longer safe. On the other hand, Xiao Bai growled at Han Han in anger, prompting her to inquire about its behavior. Xiao Bai continued growling and lunged at her, but fortunately, Tian Ran arrived in time and kicked Xiao Bai away. Frustrated by even Xiao Bai's transformation, he informed Han Han that he would take her to a safe house where she should hide and avoid coming out since it was still perilous outside. Han Han expressed concern for Xiao Bai, but he explained that Xiao Bai had become dangerous. He instructed her to listen to her big brother and never leave the safe house. Carrying Han Han in his arms, he dashed towards the farmhouse, doing his best to reach it. However, the system appeared, confirming that it wasn't an illusion. He saw that the number of living beings in the vicinity increased to four. He placed Han Han inside the farmhouse, urgently urging her to enter and emphasizing that she should trust her brother and not venture outside, regardless of the circumstances. The system displayed five living beings within range as he forcefully closed the door. Xiao Bai attacked him from behind, causing him to growl and kneel in pain. Concerned, Han Han called for her brother, and Xiao Hei defended against Xiao Bai, earning praise. He fled while instructing Xiao Hei to hold on, as he would come to its aid after dealing with the pursuing bull. He grabbed the nearby axe, turned around, and faced the charging bull. Evading at the last moment, he caused the bull to collide with a tree. The bull's horn got stuck in the tree, and he raised his axe, commanding it to go to hell. However, Xiao Bai bit him on the neck, worrying him about Xiao Hei fate. Aware that he couldn't afford to die yet, the bull freed itself and impaled its horn into his side, causing him to cough up blood. Suddenly, he heard a continuous noise that irritated him, wondering why it was so loud. The system revealed that the Apocalypse survival game was initiating a match, although he couldn't see it clearly, reminding himself not to fall asleep. Numerous system pop-ups appeared, prompting him to ponder the significance of the revolving door and growing annoyed by the noise. He demanded that the system allow him to deal with the two beasts in front of him first and shut up. The system disclosed that he was a player named Li Tian Ran, but he was preoccupied with urging the animals around him to flee. Slowly releasing his grip on the axe, he silently wished for Han Han's survival. Suddenly, the system signaled a successful match in the Apocalypse survival game, and he found himself submerged underwater, hearing the system announce the successful loading of the apocalyptic game. Player Li Tian Ran was identified, and he found himself in a poorly managed level 1 shelter. The shelter's level 1 skill reward was the Eye of Truth, and his class was categorized as B. 
He needed 8 million points to upgrade the shelter to fortress level. Suddenly, he saw a shining light that jolted him awake, bringing him back to reality. He was surprised to find himself alive, sitting up immediately. Despite the torn clothes and bloodstains, all his wounds had miraculously disappeared, leaving him perplexed about the mysterious circumstances. He wondered about the bull's whereabouts and the fate of Xiao Bai. Recalling the pain of being impaled by the bull's horn, he massaged his head. To his shock, he saw the bull severed in half and Xiao Bai lying motionless nearby. He couldn't comprehend what had happened after losing consciousness since the injuries inflicted on the animals were beyond human capabilities. Suddenly, he remembered the sensation of being possessed by the system and felt an electric surge through his body. The system indicated that his status had been activated, and he instinctively punched Xiao Bai, sending it. Flying towards the wall, he then picked up the axe from the ground and attacked the bull. The bull screamed in pain, but he stared at it with unconscious determination as his own wounds slowly healed. He leapt towards the bull, swinging his axe once again. A blinding light flashed before his eyes, bringing him back to reality, but the intense pain throughout his body overwhelmed him, causing him to scream and struggle to catch his breath. Eventually, he managed to calm down. He realized that he had died once but had been brought back to life, and the ability to heal and create explosions was not his own but likely a result of the system. Accepting this reality was difficult for him. The system displayed a message that the shelter had been successfully bound, and the mall points had been activated. Beginners' rewards had been distributed, and players were advised to check them. Puzzled by the messages, he felt another electric shock, and the system revealed that the first round of the destruction season had begun. There were still 30 days until the next round, during which natural disasters would occur, and the shelter would be the only safe place. His mission was to survive the game and build the strongest possible shelter, akin to a castle. He wondered if the system's information was directly implanted in his brain. Understanding that this was just the beginning and that the first round had already contaminated the land humans relied on for survival, he pondered how the second round would unfold. Approaching Xiao Bai, he noticed that it had passed out. Recalling what the system had mentioned, he knew that both Xiao Bai and the bull must have mutated after accidentally consuming radiation poison plants. He decided to carry Xiao Bai on his back, aware that their bodies had been strengthened after the mutation, making them extremely dangerous. His first priority was to secure Xiao Bai in a cage to prevent any harm. He made his way back into the farmhouse, thinking he should check on Han Han first. Descending the stairs, he attempted to turn on the light but realized that the power system had not been restored yet, and there was no signal. The communication system was also not functioning, but he knew he could handle it with a diesel generator. As he looked around, he noticed the absence of movement and wondered where Han Han was. His panic grew when he spotted Han Han's little feet behind a box, motionless. He called out her name urgently and quickly picked her up, asking her what was wrong. Luckily, the system displayed that she was simply sleeping, which relieved him. When Han Han woke up, she felt someone holding her and saw that it was her big brother. He asked her why she hadn't spread out the mattress and instead slept directly on the floor. She obediently replied that she had been waiting for him downstairs, but then there was a bright white light, and she couldn't remember anything. She asked if he was okay, and he reassured her, telling her that everything had been resolved. She inquired about Xiao Bai's whereabouts, and he explained that Xiao Bai was injured, so they couldn't meet for the time being. He suggested that she stay there and sleep, as he had some matters to attend to. She agreed, and after putting Han Han to sleep, he stood up and walked away. Moments later, he realized that there were no more mutant domestic animals around, which led him to contemplate the differences between the system and online games. He examined the beginner's bonus on the system, hoping to find special weapons or skills, but it seemed inadequate, and he couldn't start the game until he accumulated more points. He noticed a question mark icon on the system and clicked on it, discovering that the common currency in this system was points. He also learned that the seed item could be planted in poisoned land, indicating its high cost, which disappointed him as he considered himself poor. He understood that he could only rely on the stockpile of supplies at home, as those in direct contact with the ground were likely contaminated in various ways. With the network disconnected, he believed it would take some time to recover, and he didn't have an optimistic outlook on the situation outside. After contemplating, he remembered the bull in Xiao Bai, leading him to conclude that all sources of pollution needed to be dealt with. He proceeded to burn down the animal's house and watched it engulfed in flames. 
He returned to the farmhouse, opened one of its doors, turned on the lights, and found a shelf filled with various weapons. He selected a gun, concealed it in his jacket, left the communication radio near the sleeping Hanhan, and walked outside the farmhouse. As he drove away in his truck, he noticed that he was being chased by mutated animals, both in the air and on land. Frustrated that these creatures were all drawn to him, he took out his gun, planning to eliminate them quickly. However, he was surprised when an army truck suddenly appeared behind him and opened fire. The army truck maneuvered to block his path, forcing him to panic and bring his truck to a halt to avoid a collision. The turret of the army truck turned, pointing a machine gun at him, intensifying the tension. The soldier operating the machine gun aimed at him, and he raised his hands in the air. The soldier then reported over the radio that the road surface alarm had been lifted. He noticed that there were military forces stationed near the base, suggesting that there might be a riot in the city. He wondered about Zhang Lin's situation. The soldier cautioned him about the dangers outside and advised him to avoid wandering around. He explained that he had left home due to the lack of supplies and asked the soldier to provide an update on the current situation in the city. Over the radio, the soldier reported that Area B was under attack by mutant cats and required immediate reinforcements. He was instructed to proceed to the designated government supply point to acquire necessary provisions, as the city was no longer safe. He acknowledged the instructions and followed the army truck. While driving, he noticed a helicopter flying above them, indicating the severity of the mutant creature situation, as even military aircraft were being deployed. Despite his breakup with Jan Lin, he couldn't simply remain idle in this post-apocalyptic world. He decided to check on her situation along the way, as they had known each other before. Upon arriving in the destroyed city, he overheard a soldier reporting another looting incident on 20th Street and the discovery of a female body at Pond No. 20. As he glanced around while driving, he caught sight of a destroyed police car in his truck's mirror. Apart from police cars, there appeared to be only ambulances remaining on that street. He witnessed ambulance personnel trying to assist an injured woman, shouting that the patient had lost too much blood and was going into shock due to another case of lung damage from food poisoning. A man yelled at his co-worker to hurry up and prepare an adrenaline shot, but the co-worker expressed frustration, explaining that they had run out of cardiac stimulants due to the overwhelming number of patients. Suddenly, a glass shattered, and the woman pleaded with her injured husband not to fall asleep. She cried, telling him they were almost at the hospital. However, the man resignedly told his wife to forget it because there were no available beds, and they couldn't even get through to the emergency hotline. Witnessing this, he realized that the healthcare system was also partially paralyzed and unable to cope with the effects of radiation from the plants. He clenched the steering wheel in frustration, wondering if he could successfully guide Hanhan through the challenges of the game. A moment later, at the designated emergency supply site, a man took charge and directed the citizens, informing them that it was the government-designated location for emergency supply procurement. He emphasized the importance of everyone willingly adhering to the rules, instructing them to form an orderly queue and avoid rushing. He also explained that each person had a purchase quota, with rice priced at 160 per kilo and vegetables at 280 per kilo. A police officer informed the crowd that each individual could purchase 5 kilos of rice, 5 kilos of flour, and 1 kilo of vegetables by presenting a valid ID. However, the people waiting in line grew furious with each other, leading to disputes over their positions and the available food. A woman hugged her crying little girl, who was desperately in need of food. The scene was chaotic, with people fighting for their place in line and for the limited available food, driven by their own selfishness. He knew that his ex-girlfriend's rented apartment was just around the corner to the left, so he drove there. However, a van suddenly pulled in front of him, catching him by surprise. He managed to maneuver his truck just in time. A man emerged from the van, scanning his surroundings while holding something in his arms. He knocked on his truck and asked if he had come from the procurement site. In response, he asked the man what he wanted. The man pretended to recognize him and explained that he had seen him desperately searching for food in the market. He then displayed a bag of vegetables and fruits, listing watermelon, cucumber, pumpkin, tomatoes, and rice, and asked what he needed because he had it all. He examined the food and playfully teased the man, saying that if he dared to take a bite in front of him, he would buy everything. The man stepped back and asked what he meant, expressing surprise that he didn't trust his friend. He asked if he could buy some vegetables from him, but he simply told the man to move out of his way. 
Still, the man shouted at him, questioning why he spoke to him that way when he was a law-abiding citizen. Annoyed, he pointed his gun at the man, causing him to panic. The man urged them to talk it out, emphasizing his compliance with the law. He sternly warned the man that if he caught him engaging in heartless business, he wouldn't hesitate to use his gun and that no one would object. He then ordered the man to leave, which he did. The man stepped back, expressing his understanding, and returned the food to his van. He considered it a difficult encounter and drove away. As he continued on his way, he finally reached the destination he had in mind. He parked his truck and approached a partially destroyed apartment building. He knocked on the door of his ex-girlfriend's apartment, but there was no response. He reached for the spare key hidden under a rag, wondering if she wasn't at home. Using the key, he opened the door and called her name. To his surprise, he found the living room in disarray, which was unusual for her as she was typically a neat person. He surveyed the room and noticed contaminated fruits and medicine boxes on the table. He picked up a box of Norlex acid antibiotics, which were used to treat various bacterial infections. He knew that the local pharmaceutical company that produced it had a terrible reputation, making him wonder why she would buy from them. Examining the surroundings, he observed that there were no signs of forced entry on the door, ruling out accidental poisoning. The apartment had been ransacked, yet it didn't fit her style. He wondered where she might have gone in this chaotic world. A few days later, while at the farmhouse, the system displayed information about the poorly managed city outskirts. The shelter, rated as a guest house, offered the eye of truth as a skill reward. This skill allowed him to see detailed information about objects and creatures in front of him. Additionally, as a level 1 shelter privilege, he had the remote control shelter, which allowed him to monitor the real-time status of the shelter and all items in the mall and command it at any time. There was an area of 30 mu available for fishing, animal husbandry, planting, and construction. However, the profit and loss status were marked as a loss, and the greenhouse was in a dilapidated state. He realized that he needed to earn enough points to upgrade the farm items without affecting the development of the anti-radiation grade. He was engrossed in digging the ground with a grape hoe when Hanhan -han called him over in an excited manner. She wanted to show him that the seeds had sprouted. He asked her to come and take a look, and she was amazed to see a tomato seedling. The maturity time was only 48 hours or 2 days, which made him happy because it meant that the anti-radiation seeds worked as described by the system. The short maturity period was a positive sign, and he believed that with more points, he and Hanhan -han could survive in the post-apocalyptic world. Hanhan -han mentioned that she had thought all the planted seeds had withered, and she was worried they wouldn't have any food. She thanked him for obtaining the seeds, and he assured her that her big brother always found a way. He asked her if she remembered the rules, he had explained to her. She laughed and assured him not to underestimate her. She recalled the rules not to eat food from anyone except him, not to leave the farm without his permission, and to hide if she encountered any strange animals. She forgot the next part, and he reminded her to keep an eye on Xiao Hei and not let it eat anything it wanted. She affirmed that she understood, and Xiao Hei barked in agreement. Two days later, the system indicated that the anti-radiation crops were ripe, and he should collect them as soon as possible. He noticed that the harvest was good and picked one of the tomatoes. The system informed him that radiation-resistant tomatoes were nutritious and long-term consumption could effectively improve the body's condition. They also had a storage time of 30 days. He wondered if the tomatoes could improve his physique, so he took a bite. The tomato was sweet, and he felt a warm sensation throughout his body. The fatigue from the past few days of work vanished. In this food-scarce post-apocalyptic world, he not only had access to food but also received attribute bonuses as the crops upgraded. It seemed like he was on his way to becoming a full-fledged farm owner in the system, unlocking permissions, making mall purchases, and upgrading shelters. All of these depended on points, and different functions required varying amounts of points to unlock. The primary source of points was the exchange system, primarily used for recycling crops, livestock meat, and minerals. These items were divided into different price categories based on different grades, starting from the lowest anti-radiation grade crops, then ancient medical grade crops, followed by god-tier powerful crops, and the highest supreme god-tier enhanced crops. In level 1, anti-radiation grade crops were valued at 1 point per kilogram, 
Level 2 Ancient Medical Grade Crops were 100 points per kilogram, Level 3 God Tier Powerful Crops were 1000 points per kilogram, and Level 4 Supreme God Tier Enhanced Crops were 100,000 points per kilogram. The system provided a one-stop service from supply and sales to recycling, and as long as they had enough points, they could rapidly turn the farm into a top-tier military base, which he was looking forward to. He was pleased with the tomatoes he had grown, which were just anti-radiation grade crops. Three more grades of crops were yet to come, promising even more impressive additional effects. He looked around at the harvest of ancient medical grade crops and noticed that a few were ripe. However, he expected the 10% maturity rate of the ancient medical grade crops. The system showed him that these were ancient medicinal grade carrots with a 100% growth rate. The carrots had the remarkable effect of eliminating all negative effects such as poison, illness, and irreversible damage caused by negative effects. What's more, their storage time was unlimited, which left him amazed and relieved, as they no longer needed to worry about medical treatment. Later, he finished arranging some of the harvested crops and planned to sell 70% of the food for points, keeping the rest as reserves in his backpack. The system asked him to confirm the recycling of 200 kilograms of radiation-resistant crops, and he did so. The system indicated that the recycling was successful, rewarding him with 2,000 points. In addition, three medicinal-grade crops were stored in the warehouse along with 30 kilograms of anti-radiation-grade crops. The system congratulated him for completing his first recycling and achieving the Master of Recycling achievement, rewarding him with a smart working robot of agricultural type. Receiving a reward for his first recycling surprised him, and he thought that the achievement system could offer valuable items. He picked up the small robot and initially underestimated its usefulness. However, he noticed that it appeared to be staring at him, which made him wonder if it somehow sensed his thoughts. The robot then leapt from his hand and started to perform tasks at an impressive speed. He began to consider the idea that his consciousness might be connected to the system, and the robot he obtained through the system could directly receive commands from his brain. He changed his mind and realized that the robot was quite capable. This development led him to consider the possibilities of acquiring a combat robot in the future to enhance Hanhan's safety, which he found to be a convenient prospect. Later, he called Hanhan for a meal and told her to stop watching cartoons. He informed her that they would be having big chicken legs today to celebrate the successful seed germination. She asked him if they should be more careful with food from now on. He replied that they could start planting again and also eat some of the stored food from earlier. This made her feel touched. He told her that she could eat freely at home, but if anyone outside found out there was food at home, she would be forbidden from eating for three days. This surprised her, and she exclaimed that one day without food was already cruel enough. Then she happily assured him that she wouldn't tell anyone. He agreed and told her that they should eat because she must be craving something else after two days of instant noodles. He gave the first big chicken leg to Zohai and thanked it for protecting Hanhan and him. Hanhan hugged Zohai and told him that it was the best. But then she felt sad and wondered if Xiaobaid was feeling better now. He was silent for a moment and then reassured her not to worry about Xiaobaid because it was still too injured to come to see her temporarily. However, once Xiaobaid healed, he promised to let it come out and play with them. She agreed and he told Hanhan absolutely not to go to the attic to disturb Zobai's rest, to which she agreed. Meanwhile, behind the farm, Zobai was aggressively growling. He was surprised when the system warned him that someone was trying to invade. He ordered the system to access the monitoring screen, and it began to scan the appearance of the invader. It showed him that the invader was a 42-year-old male, unharmed, and the threat level was 3. He recognized his uncle Nan and was curious about how he ended up there. Stepping outside, he approached Nan and asked if something was wrong. Nan tossed away his cigar, addressing him as, young boss, and explained that he needed to ask for help. Nan inquired if he had any extra food on his farm because his own house had been robbed, leaving him without any stocked food. The food available in the market was too expensive for him. Nan shyly requested if he could borrow some food, acknowledging that he didn't have much stock either. The previous crops had also been destroyed due to mutation. He assured Nan that it was alright and that he could lend him some food, although not a large quantity. Nan expressed gratitude and thanked him profusely. He handed Nan a bag of instant noodles, explaining that it was all he could spare. He advised Nan to rest and think of other ways to overcome his situation. Nan agreed and thanked him again. He wished Nan good luck, 
but Nan reciprocated the sentiment and walked away. He knew that the food he shared with Nan would only last Nan's family for three to five days. Although he had enough food for himself, he understood the unpredictability of people's behavior in the future, so he decided to keep his secrets hidden. He also planned to quietly give away the regular vegetables stored in the freezer. Later, they were in his truck when Han Han expressed her desire to watch, Little Magic Fairy, at home. He informed her that the farm had not been cleared of mutated animals yet, so he didn't feel comfortable leaving her alone. She asked where they were going, and he replied that they were going to her grandfather Nan's place to bring him some food. Han Han reminisced about Nan, who used to come to their house and help, and the older brother who would give her candy. He reminded her that she could only have one candy a day, which made her panic and deny that anyone sneaked her candy. They arrived at Nan's neighborhood, noticing the unusual quietness. He speculated that people must have been afraid of their domestic animals mutating and getting rid of them. As he unloaded the food from the truck, Nan panicked and called out to his son, Xiao Tian, asking what he had done the previous day. Xiao Tian coughed continuously, causing Nan to become shocked. They witnessed Xiao Tian coughing up blood, and Nan cried out in worry, asking why his condition was worsening despite seemingly getting better earlier. Han Han anxiously asked if Nan's son was going to die because of the blood he was vomiting. He reassured her that it was okay and that she should stop looking. He realized that the symptoms were similar to accidentally eating a radioactive vegetable. He wondered if the dry foods he gave to Nan had run out so quickly. Then he remembered the medicinal grade carrots and contemplated using them as a test subject to see if Xiao Tian would survive or not. On the other hand, Nan anxiously lays his son down and exclaims with frustration that the doctors at the hospital claimed there were no available beds. They also stated that even if there were beds, they couldn't cure him. Xiao Tian clutches his neck in pain and cries, causing Nan to cry as well. He desperately asks his son what he should do, but Xiao Tian's eyes roll up as he continues to cough. Suddenly, something is thrown at their window and lands on the bed. Nan angrily demands to know who threw it and tells them to leave. However, Xiao Tian manages to signal his father to wait as he points to the object that landed on the bed. Nan instructs his son not to move while he investigates. To his shock, he discovers fresh vegetables inside when he opens it. Nan notices a paper ball among the vegetables and finds a carrot inside with words written on the paper. Nan reads the letter, which states that if he doesn't want Xiao Tian to die, he should feed him that carrot. He angrily questions if the sender is crazy and berates them for mocking him with a carrot when the big hospitals couldn't help Xiao Tian. Nan breaks down, questioning the use of having fresh vegetables now, and tells his poor son that he is useless. Despite Xiao Tian's fading vision, he manages to call his father and hold his hand, expressing his desire to try the carrot because he would still die if he just lay there, but he wants to live. Nan is stunned for a moment, but ultimately agrees to his son's request, acknowledging that the hospital couldn't cure him anyway and that he can't simply watch him die in front of him. He puts the carrot in Xiao Tian's mouth and urges his son to chew it quickly. Xiao Tian chews the carrot, but suddenly screams and convulses in pain, causing Nan to panic and call out to him in worry. Xiao Tian vomits blood onto the side of his bed and continues to do so until his pale skin starts regaining color. Nan notices the change and cries tears of joy, telling Xiao Tian that it's amazing. He smiles upon hearing that Xiao Tian is getting better. Outside, the lamp slowly lights up as the power returns, indicating that the signal should be good. He attempts to call his girlfriend, Jiang Lin, but the phone keeps ringing until a recorded message informs him that the number he dialed is currently unavailable and advises him to try again later. Meanwhile, in the car, Lin's phone rings in her pocket, irritating the driver who asks whose phone is ringing. The man takes the phone and realizes that the signal is back. The driver informs him that it belongs to the woman in the back and suggests turning off her phone. The man asks the driver how much food they received after it was delivered, and the driver replies that they wouldn't have to worry about food and drink for at least a few months. This makes the man laugh as he comments on how exciting it is to work with his overweight brother. The man then asks the driver what he thinks they want with those people, but the driver replies that he doesn't care and that they're only there to take the money and keep quiet. Meanwhile, on the road, Han Han tells him that her older brother is very strong because she witnessed how much blood Xiao Tian vomited, yet simply eating a carrot made him fine. She observes how quickly Xiao Tian's body changes from grey to blue, finding it fascinating. Han Han continued to engage him in conversation with her vivid imagination, 
giving him the impression that she had a deep love for animation. Her descriptions were incredibly detailed. However, their interaction was interrupted when something suddenly jumped onto the roof of his truck, causing him to momentarily lose control and wonder what was happening. A monstrous hand appeared in front of them, followed by a creature with red eyes, a mutated monkey. The monkey growled menacingly, instilling panic in him. He urgently told Han Han to hold on tight as he maneuvered his truck to the side, hoping to make the monkey fall off. However, the creature clung tightly to the truck and attempted to attack him from inside. In response, he pulled out his gun, shouting for it to get down, and fired at the area where it was holding on. Despite his efforts, the monkey leapt in front of his truck. Frustrated, he started the truck again and drove it forward, but the monkey stubbornly clung on. He shielded Han Han with his other arm and forcefully rammed the truck into a nearby tree, causing the monkey to collide with it. Taking aim, he shot the creature in the head, causing it to explode. Stepping out of his truck, he inspected the lifeless monkey lying in front of it and discarded it. However, his attention was drawn to a serial number on the animal's arm, leaving him wondering about its origin since there were no nearby breeding farms or zoos. Then, he recalled the brand of a pharmaceutical company, Tannin Pharmaceuticals, realizing it was the only nearby establishment. Meanwhile, in a large building, numerous animals were flying around, creating a chaotic scene. Back at Tian Ran's house, he instructed Han Han to watch some animation as he had something to attend to. She agreed, and he made his way to the basement of their farmhouse. Sitting in front of Xiao Bai, who was confined in a cage, Tian Ran sighed while wearing gloves. The system asked him if he wanted to administer the medicinal carrot, and he replied affirmatively. He forcefully fed the carrot to Xiao Bai, believing that since the medicine could cleanse toxins from irradiated vegetables, it could also restore Xiao Bai to his former self. After inserting the entire carrot into Xiao Bai's mouth, he let go and hoped for the carrot to work. Xiao Bai glared and growled at him in anger, but suddenly, Xiao Bai let out a loud scream. On the other hand, Han Han heard a deafening thunder sound, causing her to tremble in fear. She stood up, assuming it was a powerful lightning strike, and felt a bit scared, wondering why her older brother hadn't arrived yet. Determined to find him, she ventured into the basement. Moving silently, she planned to surprise him from behind. As she approached him, she startled him, causing him to jump in shock. Worriedly, he looked at her, but she laughed and playfully asked if he was scared. Just as she was about to share something with him, he noticed something on the ground. To her horror, Han Han saw Xiao Bai lying on the ground, covered in blood. Overwhelmed, she lost her balance, prompting her brother to urge her to compose herself. Tearfully, she asked him why it happened and if they had any carrots that could save lives. Then, she implored him to feed the carrot quickly. He explained to her that carrots couldn't save mutated living beings like Xiao Bai. However, before he could finish his sentence, she expressed her refusal, stating that she didn't want Xiao Bai to die in vain. She screamed Xiao Hei's name in anguish and cried uncontrollably. A little while later, they proceeded to burn Xiao Bai's body and buried it near the tree. Han Han remained silent as he held her hand, sensing the dropping temperature and suggesting they return. He called out to Han Han to join them for dinner, mentioning that it was her favorite food. However, she continued watching anime without acknowledging him. He sighed and instructed Xiao Hayes to stay with Han Han in the house, to which the dog barked in agreement. Checking the system, he noticed that the radiation-resistant crops had matured and needed to be harvested in a timely manner. Clicking on the system, he saw that the crops had been successfully harvested, with the radiation-resistant ones weighing 500 kilograms and the ancient medicinal-grade crop weighing 10 kilograms. His mini-robot jumped onto his shoulder while he focused on the system, which showed that the points had been successfully redeemed. He decided to upgrade his dilapidated greenhouse from level 1 to level 2. However, the system warned him that his defense shelter was only rated at level 3 and could only protect against small wild animals, posing a high risk. It recommended establishing a defense system as soon as possible. He agreed with the system, realizing that improving the farm's safety should be his top priority. With the current crop level growing rapidly, he could temporarily delay expanding production. He upgraded the wall reinforcement from level 1 to level 2, purchased a perimeter power grid, and obtained a radar parade level 1. Noticing that he had few points remaining, he saw something in the item shop that caught his attention. Unfortunately, it cost 3,500 points, 
frustrating him as he didn't have enough. He considered selling the grain stored in the warehouse to earn more points if needed. Determined, he decided to purchase the two robots first. The system confirmed the successful purchase, and he acquired a level 1 hummingbird, with a load of 100 one hundredths, damage of 0 one hundredths, speed of 5, and defense of 1. Its attack method involved shooting. He also obtained a level 2 hound, a combat warrior with a load of 50-50, fuel capacity of 100 one hundredths, speed of 4, damage of 6, and defense of 5. Its attack methods included burning, shooting, and biting. Mentally commanding the hummingbird warrior, he watched as it crushed fallen leaves with precise bullet shots, impressing him with its sniping abilities. He was relieved to have an air patrol sniper at his disposal and decided to test its ground combat strength. Ordering the hound warrior, he witnessed it gather power in its mouth and blow a huge stone into pieces, further reassuring him. He entered the house and called out to Han Han, who was still engrossed in television. A robot dog appeared next to her, and he explained that it would now follow and protect her, asking her to give it a name. She agreed to the name Zhao Bai. Meanwhile, in the Tannen Pharmaceuticals building, a man reported that the out-of-control samples had been cleaned up, and only sample number 7's data was steadily rising. He remarked that it could easily punch through 5 mm thick steel plates. The man in the suit inquired about the situation on the other side, and the other man responded that their vice president, Ren, was already highly dissatisfied with their failure to donate medical equipment. If she were to find out, it would be detrimental, and reporting it to the head office would be even worse. The man in the suit firmly grasped his seat as the general manager of Chanan Pharmaceuticals, Liang Tanu, sat down with a smile. Tanu assured the man that it was merely a minor incident involving a girl and had been carried out discreetly. If Ren wanted to investigate, she would have to know where to begin. The man agreed with Tanu but reminded him that the head office was keeping a close eye on them. Tanu instructed the man to ensure that Chen kept a watchful eye on Ren Xiao and prevented her from disrupting their business. The man agreed and left the room. Tanu turned his chair around and smiled, contemplating the possibility of a great treasure. Shortly after, a woman approached the receptionist and inquired about Liang Tanu's whereabouts. The receptionist apologized and addressed her as Vice President Ren. The receptionist informed Ren that Tanu was currently absent from the company and that she was making things very difficult for them. However, Ren forcefully opened Tanu's office door and confronted him, demanding an explanation for his actions. She criticized him for neglecting his responsibilities as a medical company, particularly at a time when the entire southern region's medical system was paralyzed. She urged him to lead his staff in actively cooperating with hospitals and donating equipment and medicines instead of being preoccupied with animal experiments. Tanu retorted that it was his manager's office and deemed her intrusion inappropriate. He argued that as a businessman, his primary goal was to profit from all endeavors, and he doubted that today's medical treatment could effectively address the global disease. Ren was taken aback by his response, but Tanu reminded her that she too was a shareholder in the company and enjoyed the right to dividends. He asked her to imagine the immense rewards they could reap if they were able to develop a solution. Intrigued, Ren inquired about the progress of his research, mentioning that even the Yan Wang federal government had yet to develop any effective drugs. She expressed her intention to visit his laboratory and her pendant necklace emitted a sound. However, Tanu admitted that he was only joking and questioned how they could develop a solution so quickly. He proposed that with increased cooperation and investment in manpower, progress would be accelerated. Ren informed him that she would visit the lab later to assess the progress but insisted on seeing it first before fully committing to the project. Tanu welcomed her and arranged for a personal escort. She agreed to go and he assured her that he would see her out later. A man whispered to Ren that the technical team claimed her time in the office was too short and they could only perform a preliminary scan. He also mentioned that the entrance to the secret laboratory was likely not in Tanu's office. This revelation frustrated Ren, who referred to Tanu as an old fox. She then inquired if they had obtained a statement from the captured scientist, to which the man replied negatively, as they were blindfolded during every entry and exit. However, they did manage to obtain the key card, earning the man's praise. He handed her the key card, leaving her pondering where else it could be used apart from the known locations. She speculated that the most dangerous place might also be the safest and believed she knew its whereabouts. Later, a director introduced himself as Tuai, responsible for accompanying and providing explanations to Ren. He would also show her around. 
Ren suggested they first assess the progress of the experimental subjects, to which Tuai agreed and led the way. They arrived at the area where the captured animals were held, and the director explained that subject number 7 was the only one in the experimental batch that didn't become uncontrollably powerful. Although its power increased tenfold, it still exhibited some instability and aggression. While they were conversing, a panicked man approached the director and whispered something to him, surprising both of them. As they whispered to each other, she observed them with a smile and apologized for the interruption. The director informed her that there was an emergency and he couldn't continue accompanying her. He suggested that a colleague behind him could take over. She assured him that it was fine since it was just a routine check, and she would explore the area on her own for a while before leaving. The director was concerned that it might go against the rules, but she reassured him that they were all under surveillance coverage and asked him what he was worried about. She encouraged him to go quickly and not delay, assuring him that they would watch out for her safety. They both left, and she activated the device on her ear, indicating that it was time to take action. The man agreed, disabling the surveillance on his computer and confirming that it was covered. She instructed the man to scan the area for their hideout, and he guided her to the northeast corner, where there should be a hollow in the wall or a mechanism that could be pressed down. He also informed her that she had 30 minutes. She pressed down the wall, revealing a hidden compartment, and was shocked to find numerous humans in capsules. The man asked her how it was, and she replied that it was worse than anticipated. He inquired if he should contact the head office for intervention, but she told him to wait for a moment. As she looked up, she noticed a woman in a tube with a fish tail beneath it. The woman's name, Jangling, was written on the description, which filled her with anger towards Tanu. Meanwhile, on Tian Ran's farm, the system indicated that his radiation-resistant corn was ready for harvesting. Han Han looked at them in awe and asked her to come and help him finish work early for dinner. She picked a corn and expressed her excitement about grilling it later. Tianren asked if she was already hungry, and she replied that she was too famished to continue picking corn. He instructed her to gather some driwood while he prepared grilled corn with butter, which made her jump with joy. While they were grilling the corn, Han Han asked what would happen if she kept eating like this and turned into a fat pig. Tianren explained that the special crop could enhance their physical fitness, and as their bodies grew, their nutrient requirements would increase. He assured her that eating more food wouldn't make them gain weight but would help them grow taller. The system displayed Han Han's strength, intelligence, speed, and endurance, all of which had increased significantly. Tianren pondered whether Han Han would turn into a King Kong Barbie, if she continued eating like this and expressed concern for his beloved little sister. However, he considered that he might be overthinking things. Han Han exclaimed how delicious the grilled corn was, and Tianren promised to make her a spicy one. He considered that even if Han Han's appetite grew as big as Luffy's in the future, they would still be able to afford it with their shelter. However, the system alerted him that a visitor was approaching, leaving him curious about who would visit at such a time. He saw Xiao Tian standing at their gate, holding the food that he had given to Xiao Tian's family. He approached the gate and questioned why Xiao Tian was there. Xiao Tian handed him the bag of food and explained that he wanted to return the favor. He mentioned that his family had received some food recently, so he brought it to him. He accepted the gesture, knowing that it was the food he had given to Xiao Tian's family, and he didn't think he had helped the wrong person. He inquired about where Xiao Tian obtained all the food, and Xiao Tian replied that he found it in their yard. It might have been secretly sent by a relative or someone who sneaked it in. Shyly, Xiao Tian mentioned that he also had another request, asking if it was okay to ask. He encouraged Xiao Tian to speak up, and Xiao Tian explained that he heard about a new grain shopping center on the outskirts of the southern side that had plenty of stock available. He wanted to borrow his truck to go there and buy some. He agreed and told Xiao Tian that he could borrow the truck. However, Xiao Tian informed him that he didn't have a driver's license, and the shopping center was in a remote location. He asked if he could drive him there. Panicking, Xiao Tian assured him that it wasn't too far away. He realized that Xiao Tian not only wanted to borrow the truck but also his driving skills. Xiao Tian also assured him that it wouldn't take too long and pleaded for his help. As he had been stuck on the farm recently, he had planned to visit the shopping center in a couple of days to inquire about the situation. However, since it was earlier than expected, he decided to drive Xiao Tian there. With the mechanical guards at home, he felt relieved even if Han Han's alone because with Xiao Bai, 
their combat power would be sufficient to handle even a small group. He agreed to Xiao Tian's request and mentioned that they were old acquaintances. However, he emphasized the need to return before noon to cook for Han Han, to which Xiao Tian agreed and apologized for the trouble. He instructed Xiao Tian to wait for him as he prepared the truck, and Xiao Tian agreed. Shortly after, he told Han Han to stay at home and not open the door if anyone called. He assured her that he would return soon. Han Han replied that she wouldn't worry because, the Bai, the upgraded version of their robot dog, was awesome. He asked her how it became, the Bai, and she explained that it was because it was an upgraded version, and she had tested it by watching it blow up big rocks with a, bam bam. He reminded her that she could only use, the Bai, in emergencies in the future as it could be dangerous otherwise. She agreed and assured him that she wouldn't blow up rocks anymore, momentarily silencing him. He patted her head and reassured her that he and her brother Xiao Tian would go to the shopping center and come back with candy for her. She asked if Xiao Tian was there because she wanted to say hello, but he questioned why she wanted to do that and reminded her that she couldn't reveal, the bye, in front of outsiders. He gently squeezed her cheek, and she reassured him that she understood because she was already six years old and not a child anymore. She added that besides her older brother, no one really talks to her at home, which makes her feel suffocated. As they drove out of the farm with the truck window down, Han Han eagerly looked at Xiao Tian, about to say something to him. However, Tianren put his hand on her head and pulled her hair, telling her to get out of the car so that Xiao Tian could leave early and he could be back in time to cook for her. They drove away, leaving Han Han angrily calling him a stinky big brother and shouting that she hadn't even finished saying hello. However, she eventually walked back, deciding to forget about it and watch cartoons instead. Meanwhile, Tianren and Xiao Tian were busy driving away. Tianren thought Han Han was a bit impulsive, but he knew she had a tendency to talk too much. The road was silent for a moment, and then Xiao Tian asked if it was safe for Han Han to be home alone because the world was chaotic, and he was afraid that bad guys might target the farm, putting Han Han in danger. Tianren asked who would bother with their small, rundown farm with no money or food. Xiao Tian asked if he hadn't left any self-defense tools for Han Han, and Tianren explained that she was only six years old and wouldn't know how to use them even if she had them. He assured Xiao Tian that there was no safer place than their farm at the moment and mentioned that he had electrified the farm gate, making it difficult for anyone to break in. Xiao Tian replied that it was a relief and then took out his phone from his pocket to text someone. Tianren glanced at him and noticed, but Xiao Tian quickly put his phone back and explained that he was worried about not having enough money, so he planned to borrow some from his friends. Tianren remained silent. Meanwhile, back at the farm, Han Han excitedly shouted about the Rainbow Warrior and pretended to attack imaginary enemies. She shouted that her brother Xiao Tian could also change his color and join the Rainbow Warriors like her. A sudden realization struck Han Han, leading her to wonder if Xiao Tian could potentially be a member of the Rainbow Warriors. She recalled that during her previous encounter with Xiao Tian, he appeared green, but this time, he was red. This stark contrast in his appearance raised suspicions in her mind. On the road, Tian Ran handed some money to Xiao Tian and told him to take it. Xiao Tian seemed hesitant and mentioned that he had already received a lot of help from Tianren, unsure if he could accept more money. However, Tianren insisted and forcefully placed the money in Xiao Tian's hand, telling him to keep it. He also advised Xiao Tian to stop talking nonsense because they still had to focus on driving. Xiao Tian expressed his gratitude and promised to repay Tianren's kindness. Following the navigator's instructions, they were told to go straight for 500 meters, then turn right in 300 meters. At 200 meters, there would be a fork in the road, and finally, they would need to turn right 100 meters ahead. However, Xiao Tian suddenly grabbed the wheel and suggested going left instead, claiming that the road on the right appeared to be closed. Tianren gave him a strange look and forcefully stopped the truck. Frustrated, he slammed his hand on the steering wheel, insisting that the road on the right couldn't be closed without a major natural disaster since it was a main road in the township that he often traveled on. He asked Xiao Tian where he had heard the news. Xiao Tian provided an explanation that a friend had informed him, but he insisted on knowing the friend's identity and urged him to call that friend so he could hear the news directly. Xiao Tian, in a desperate plea, grabbed his coat and begged him to trust him just this once, assuring him that he had no intention of causing harm. He requested that they turn left before it became too late. Despite being irritated by Xiao Tian's behavior, 
Tianren made the decision to turn the truck and follow the direction suggested by Xiao Tian. Meanwhile, another individual became upset upon noticing the truck changing lanes. The man shouted that something had occurred, and the driver angrily expressed his disbelief in Xiao Tian breaking his promise. A passenger in the car, named Nan, asked for guidance on what to do. Activated a device on his ear, indicating his preparedness, and informed his companions that their target was approaching them. He reminded them of Liang's instruction to prioritize their own survival. The man acknowledged the orders and confirmed his understanding. Nan instructed the driver to turn around and block the path of the truck, while the second team would launch an attack from behind. He wanted to test if they could successfully escape that day. On the other hand, Tianren drove at a fast pace, his anger intensifying. He angrily demanded an explanation from Xiao Tian, insisting that he should disclose what was happening. Xiao Tian repeatedly apologized, burdened by guilt for betraying Tianren, and admitted that he was solely responsible for their predicament. He explained that he had no choice as his father had been taken captive. Tianren was both shocked and furious, Tian Ran appealed for him to remain calm, to which he inquired about the identity and intentions of the individuals. Xiao Tian clarified that they were representatives from Tianren company who were aware of Tian Ran's possession of medicine for the poisoning. They had deceived him into leaving the farm, planning to seize Han Han in his absence in order to coerce Tianren into complying with their demands. Tian Ran grew visibly enraged, expressing disbelief that they had involved in the abduction of a six-year-old child. As Tian Ran glanced at the side mirror, he noticed the kidnappers closing in on them. Determined, Tian Ran accelerated the car, while Xiao Tian anxiously exclaimed about the pursuers drawing closer. Filled with anger, Tian Ran sternly commanded him to be quiet. Tianren instructed Xiao Tian to remain silent and angrily questioned the authenticity of the information provided, suspecting it may have been a test to assess the farm's security and Xiao Tian's connection to those people. Tianren noted that even when Xiao Tian appeared to be casually using his phone earlier, he was actually communicating with them. While Han Han was enjoying his snacks, Xiao He noticed something outside the farm group of men wearing suits and carrying weapons, accompanied by a backhoe, outside the farm. Xiao Tian expressed his apologies and pleaded with Tianren to hand over the medicine, citing the overwhelming number of pursuers and their slim chances of escaping. Tianren expressed deep disappointment in Xiao Tian, emphasizing his reluctance to harm him but struggling to comprehend the extent of the harm inflicted upon Han Han. Tearfully, Xiao Tian apologized, expressing regret for his actions, but emphasized that with his father's life in danger, there was no turning back, he stressed the imminent threat of capture, urging Tianren to surrender the medicine. Frustrated, Tianren tightly gripped the steering wheel of the truck and informed Xiao Tian that he would address their issues later. Unfortunately, neither of them had a chance to leave the farm alive. In the midst of this turmoil, Xiao Tian recalled his father's joyous remark about finally feeling better. However, he had unintentionally frightened his father to the point of distress. In response, his father asked him about the food he had consumed that led to his improved condition. He responded that he was incredibly hungry and couldn't bear it any longer. At that point, he discovered an apple in the cellar that appeared to be uncontaminated. His father acknowledged his desperation but questioned how he could dare to eat something from the cellar when he knew everything in there had touched the ground. He explained to his father that they had been subsisting on meager porridge for several days, so he took a chance with the apple to avoid starving to death sooner or later. However, his father scolded him and dismissed his explanation, stating that he had borrowed food and they had also received a food shipment. Furthermore, there was a miraculous potion that had saved his life, which he believed was a divine gift since they couldn't bear to see him suffer so much. Many people had perished from accidentally consuming poisonous vegetables, but he was the sole survivor, so they planned to visit their ancestors' graves later to express gratitude for their blessings. However, he pondered whether a true god would allow such disasters to occur in the world, and the unidentified person who provided the potion didn't want their identity revealed. His father asked if he was still hungry, but he couldn't fathom how much food that person could actually provide while their own family was left to starve without even the basic necessities for survival. He felt that life was unjust and abruptly stood up with a thought in his mind, rushing out of their house. His father inquired where he was going, and he assured him that he would return soon. Despite his father's attempt to dissuade him, he told his father to leave him alone. Shortly afterward, he arrived at a house, and the occupant inside shouted at him to stop knocking and identify himself. 
He called the man, Meow, and Meow was astonished to see him, asking him what he wanted. Looking down and realizing he was covered in blood, he explained to Meow that their home had been robbed, and he wanted to check the surveillance video of their house. Meow questioned his statement and pointed to the device on the roof, which he confirmed was the one he needed and recalled its 360 degrees wireless monitoring capability. Meow agreed, and he asked Meow to lend it to him so he could assess the extent of his injuries inflicted by the thief. Meow urged him to hurry as it was bedtime. He proceeded to review the footage, knowing that the camera had a clear view of the alley near his house. As he examined the screen, he wondered who the culprit was and was taken aback to see the license plate of a truck near his house. Afterward, he returned home, and his father asked him what he had been doing. He informed his father that he had discovered who had saved his life. His father inquired about the identity of the savior, and he replied that it was their young boss, Lai. He had reviewed the CCTV footage and found that the truck's arrival and departure times aligned with the time of his rescue. His father exclaimed that their young boss, Lai, was indeed a kind person who provided them with food and saved their lives. However, hesitated for a moment and asked if he had heard the news that the Tannen group was offering a generous reward for finding a cure. Calling him a troublemaker, his father questioned his intentions. He explained that he simply aimed to make their lives a bit easier in this harsh world. He asked his father about the remaining duration of the limited food they had in their plan once it ran out. His father was taken aback by this question, but he persisted by questioning whether his father expected their boss, Young Lee, to continue providing them with food. In response, his father violently slapped him, accusing him of wanting to repay Tannen's kindness with ingratitude. He even threatened to break his legs if he dared to leave. However, he asked his father if he didn't comprehend their current predicament and explained that if they wanted to survive, they could only rely on themselves. He believed he was merely doing what was necessary to stay alive. On the road, Tian Ran felt frustrated as the enemy continued to pursue him closely, making it difficult for him to shake them off. Two additional cars blocked his path, so he forcefully stopped his truck to avoid colliding with the cars in front. Men emerged from the cars, and the other vehicle behind him blocked his escape route. He stepped out of the car, holding Zat Tian, and one of the men teasingly asked if he was Li Tian Ran. The man introduced himself as Chen Nan, affiliated with Chanan Pharmaceutical Company. Chen Nan clarified that they used this unconventional method to meet him but had no ulterior motive. They were aware that he possessed the cure for the poisoning pandemic and wanted to discuss cooperation. They proposed that if he provided the cure, they would join forces and generate significant profits together. He inquired about the consequences if he refused, and Chen Nan stated that there were only two options. The first option was voluntary cooperation, leading to a favorable outcome where they could all profit with smiles on their faces. He asked about the second option, and Chen Nan replied that they could acquire the cure by any means necessary and could always make him talk. He explained to Chen Nan that he had stumbled upon the cure for the poisoning epidemic purely by chance, and there was only one dose, which he had already administered to Xiao Tian. He apologized to Chen Nan for their wasted journey. He noticed that the individuals accompanying Chen Nan didn't carry guns, and Xiao Tian was already useless to them. If they had guns, they could have simply injured him without the need for further discussion. Chen Nan took out his phone and remarked that it seemed he wouldn't be swayed even if he saw his own demise. Chen Nan then made a phone call to his men, inquiring if they were at the farm gate and instructing them to enter and capture the little girl, intending to feed her the poisonous fruits. Chen Nan playfully questioned the purpose of electrifying his broken fence when their men were skilled in insulation protection. He advised him that if he intended to oppose Chan and company, he needed to recognize his own value and willingly cooperate to make money together. However, Chen Nan was taken aback when he emitted a powerful light and expressed his deep hatred for threats, leaving Chen Nan wondering how such a humble farmer could possess such terrifying eyes. He warned them that they should be grateful they hadn't invaded the farm because, with him present, they could prolong their lives, at least for a little while. Chen Nan ordered him to stop talking and cooperate for the little girl's survival. Chen Nan believed that there were many of them, so they shouldn't fear him, but he simply stared at them, leading Chen Nan to conclude that he wouldn't cooperate. Chen Nan then instructed his men to sever his limbs and leave him alive. Meanwhile, at the farm, men dressed in suits were outside the property, using an excavator to demolish the wall. The noise infuriated Han Han, who shouted that it was so loud that she couldn't enjoy her cartoon in peace. 
She expressed her wish to blow the heads off those bad guys. On the road, Chan Ran was engaged in a battle with the men, and one by one, they were being thrown back towards Chen Nan. Chen Nan looked back in surprise and noticed that Cha flat stomach, leaving him curious about what was happening. He remembered that anti-personnel weapons were meant to be found only on the farm, so his plan was to lure that guy away from his farm. Meanwhile, a man near the farm was using binoculars and noticed that something was amiss. Rocks were being blasted apart, and although it was a significant distance, his best guess was that it involved explosive weaponry. Back on the road, Tian Ran attacked the men surrounding him, leaving Chen Nan astounded by the farmer's immense power. Tian Ran hadn't anticipated that the physical enhancements from consuming radiation-resistant crops would be so formidable. In just a few days, his physical attributes had significantly improved, including strength, speed, bone density, and reflexes. Tian Ran decided to create some distance, believing he had tested his physical capabilities enough. He then retrieved a gun from his jacket and aimed it at the men, catching them off guard. Chen Nan realized he had been careless in assuming that firearms wouldn't be necessary. He was surprised to see that Tian Ran also had a gun. Chen Nan warned him not to mess with the influential figure backing him and to consider the consequences if he laid a hand on him. Chen Nan believed that as long as he could get close to Chen Ran, the gun would be useless. Tian Ran acknowledged that Chen Nan was right and proceeded to shoot the men, informing Chen Nan that he still had some use. However, there was no need to spare the others. Chen Nan fell to the ground as bullets whizzed by, and he was hit near the ears, causing him to cry out in pain. While the other men were shot and killed, Chen Nan quickly fled, thinking he should hide in the woods and wait until Tian Ran ran out of bullets. Tian Ran attempted to pursue Chen Nan while firing at him, but Chen Nan managed to find cover behind a nearby rock. Chen Nan believed that Tian Ran had stopped and assumed that he must have run out of bullets, which he considered advantageous. He planned to hide for a while and then launch a surprise attack on Tian Ran, thinking he still had a chance of winning. Unbeknownst to Chen Nan, Tian Ran was actually positioned above him, wearing a smile as he examined the system. He opened his inventory, retrieved his pistol from the warehouse, and reloaded it. Chen Nan heard the sound of the reload and looked back, questioning why Tian Ran still had a bullet. He wondered if Tian Ran was a martial artist, but Tian Ran simply shot Chen Nan. Meanwhile, at the farm, the robotic bird fired a shot at the man outside. The system informed Hanan that, in accordance with her instructions, the last intruder's head had been blown off and asked for her next instruction. Hanan, concerned that her big brother would be upset if he discovered what she had done and might not like her anymore, shook her head. She was determined to dispose of the evidence outside the door before her big brother returned. While traveling on the road, Chan Nan sustained injuries and was bleeding. He confessed to Tian Ran that he had made a grave error by using the child as a tool for intimidation and pleaded for the torment to cease. Tian Ran offered Chan Nan two options, a quick and painless death or a flicker of hope, as he possessed the means to cure him and continue their conversation since, he had ample time and resources. The decision now rested with Chan Nan. Chan Nan requested that Tian Ran proceed with his questions, prompting Tian Ran to inquire about the person who was orchestrating the events behind Chan Nan. Chan Nan disclosed that it was Liang Tian, the CEO of Tianran. As Tian Ran wiped the blood from his face, he realized that Tian was responsible for the exorbitant drug prices, which explained his relentless behavior. Tian Ran then probed further, asking if there were any additional individuals involved besides Liang Tian. Chan Nan asserted that Tian bore sole responsibility and had successfully kept it concealed, even from high-ranking executives within the company. Chan Nan had recently been at odds with the vice presidents, intending to leverage this situation to bolster his own authority and impress the headquarters while sidelining the other vice president at the southern city branch. Tian Ran came to the realization that Tanan Pharmaceutical, the company monopolizing southern city, was merely a subsidiary of a larger conglomerate. Frustrated, Tian Ran slapped Chan Nan, urging him to wake up and questioning whether Tian had reported the matter to the headquarters. Chan Nan revealed that Tian had refrained from doing so because the other vice president had connections at the headquarters, and Tian feared the repercussions of escalating the issue to that level. Disclosing information to that particular vice president would jeopardize Tian's plans. Chan Nan was aware that the news had not yet spread widely, making the resolution of the matter relatively manageable. Subsequently, 
Chan Nan was informed by Tian Ran that one final element was required, and San was instructed to accompany him to Sang Tiano. Later, in the office, Tianu answered a phone call from Chan Nan, who confirmed the completion of the mission. However, the target insisted on meeting Tianu and an elderly man before divulging any information. Enraged, Tianu berated Chan Nan, deeming them utterly useless if they were unable to handle such a minor issue without his personal involvement. Chan Nan apologized and mentioned the tight-lipped nature of Tian Ran, highlighting the loss of several comrades during the process. Tianu agreed and directed Chan Nan to take Tian Ran to warehouse number 78, expressing his intention to join them shortly. However, Chan Nan abruptly ended the call before Tianu could finish his sentence, leading Tianu to hurl the phone onto the sofa in anger and vow to replace Chan Nan as soon as he reached the headquarters. Meanwhile, in the car, the person holding the phone disconnected the call. Xiao Tian expressed immense gratitude to Tian Ran. Nevertheless, Tian Ran informed Xiao Tian that his father, Nan, was merely an incidental acquaintance, advising him against becoming too sentimental. As they drove away, Xiao Tian cried and continuously apologized. A minute later, they arrived at the warehouse and entered. Chanu, who was holding old Nan, and questioned Xiao Tian about the absence of Chan Nan and the messenger. Xiao Tian explained that the messenger had been rendered unconscious and left in the car, while Chan Nan had a stomach ache and had gone to the restroom. Xiao Tian further conveyed Chan Nan's concerns. Chanu, growing impatient, instructed Xiao Tian to bring him and Chan Nan over first. He implied that Tian Ran hadn't struck hard enough and mentioned the presence of the old man, suggesting that if Tian Ran talked, he would set him free. However, the old Nan was crying and tried to prevent Tian Ran from speaking, as Tianu had no intention of letting any of them leave alive. This angered Chanu, who kicked the old man to the ground and shouted at him to be honest. This left Xiao Tian shaking with anger. Tianu asked Xiao Tian why he was staring and ordered him to bring Tian Ran over, while the men continued to kick the old Nan. Suddenly, someone stepped on Chanu base and forcefully slammed him to the ground, surprising his men. Tian Ran pointed a gun at Tianu's face and mentioned the difficulty of climbing the wall. The men anxiously called their boss, but he told them not to move, and Tianu ordered them to stay back. Tianu asked how this person had arrived where Chan Nan was and whether Chan Nan had betrayed him. He challenged the person to touch him, but Tian Ran questioned how someone of his intelligence had become the head of Tianran and had invested all his skills in being a heartless jerk. Tian Ran pointed out that his loyal subordinate was right there, indicating Chan Nan, who was in Xiao Tian's custody. Tianu angrily called Tian Ran a little brat and threatened that if he touched him, he would have them kill the stubborn old man immediately. However, Tian Ran agreed, saying that killing him would be more cost-effective than harming unrelated people. Xiao Tian shouted at Tian Ran to save Chan Nan. Chanu then ordered his men to kill the old Nan and placed his finger on the gun trigger. However, Tian Ran suddenly shot the men near the old Nan, leaving Tianu asking his dying men if they were stupid. Tian Ran shot Tianu in the head, killing him instantly. A moment later, the old Nan thanked him for not holding him accountable for the foolish actions of his useless son and told him that he knew those apologies were futile, but he was still grateful to him. Meanwhile, the old Nan was apologizing to him, and he told the old Nan that he didn't support the guilt by association concept and hadn't done anything to harm him. However, the old Nan told him that he was also at fault as a father for not stopping Xiao Tian, making him guilty too. Tian Ran assured Chan Nan that he didn't need to keep apologizing and advised him to let go of the idea because he didn't deserve forgiveness. He also assured Xiao Tian that he wouldn't harm him because it was unnecessary. As for what would happen next, Xiao Tian interrupted him by swearing that they knew nothing about it and could trust them. He then asked how Tian Ran planned to handle the situation there. Tian Ran ordered Xiao Tian to gather the bodies together, to which Xiao Tian immediately agreed. He told them that he would bring the car in, prompting the old Nan to ask him what he was going to do. He responded by asking the old Nan what else they could do and answered that obviously, it was to eliminate all traces. Chan piled up the dead bodies and asked his father if Chan Ran was planning to burn the bodies. The old Nan, who was walking toward Chan Nan, replied that he thought so and that it was not easy to be exposed in the middle of nowhere. The old Nan dragged Chan Nan, but then Chan Nan grabbed a piece of broken glass and attempted to stab the old Nan. Luckily, the old Nan managed to dodge the piece of glass just in time. And it struck his knee instead. 
Chan Nan taunted the old Nan about his dodging skills, and Xiao Tian, who overheard their conversation, immediately turned back with concern. Chan Nan raised the glass shard and shouted that since he was on a dead-end road anyway, taking someone down with him before he died wasn't a bad deal. He swung the glass toward the old Nan, but Xiao Tian jumped in front of his father just in time and got pierced in the chest instead. The old Nan was shocked and screamed in agony for his son. Simultaneously, a truck collided with Chan Nan, pinning him to the wall. Chan Ran, who was driving the truck, got out and walked towards the old Nan, who was in distress. Xiao Tian called out to his father and admitted that he was useless, unable to be a good person, but he didn't have the courage to be a bad one either. He blamed himself for putting his father in such a dangerous situation due to his selfish desires. He believed he deserved it and was willing to give his life back to his father. Xiao Tian also asked his father to thank Han Han on his behalf and gave him something, possibly a candy, while wondering if the candies and food from that night were from Han Han because they seemed like something a child would enjoy. Xiao Tian closed his eyes and whispered to his father, asking him to thank Han Han once again because the candy was sweet. As Xiao Tian remained motionless, the old Nan cried in agony, but then he stood up, holding the glass shard that had pierced Xiao Tian's chest, and walked determinedly towards Chan Nan. The old Nan raised the glass shard and repeatedly struck Chan Nan with it. After this brutal act, they set fire to the entire abandoned building, including the bodies. Later, someone frantically called Ren Xiao and informed her of a major development. Ren Xiao asked about the situation and urged the caller not to panic but to explain slowly. However, the caller shouted that they had discovered information about Liang Tenu, revealing that Tenu was dead. Ren Xiao was so shocked that she spilled her coffee and immediately rushed to the investigation room. She asked the examiner if they had confirmed Tenu's identity. The examiner affirmed that, despite the heavily damaged state of the body, they had managed to extract DNA from the dental pulp and confirmed that the bodies were indeed Liang Tenu and Chan Nan. However, they couldn't find any data on the other bodies in the genetic database, and no one had been reported missing. Due to limited police resources, they couldn't conduct further investigations to confirm the identities of the deceased. Ren Xiao stated that the identities didn't matter and asked if it was a murder or an accident. The examiner explained that it was a murder because several victims had bullet fragments in their bodies, and the fire seemed to have been deliberately set using a car. Some of the bodies also showed signs of torture before death. Rina speculated that someone had offended a ruthless individual but wasn't sure if they were targeting Liang Tenu personally or Tamarin Corporation. She realized that if it was the former, she would celebrate with two bottles of red wine, but if it was the latter, they would be her enemies. Meanwhile, on the farm, someone purchased a remote detonation device and asked the old Nan if he was sure he wanted revenge. Old Nan responded firmly, saying that he was willing to sacrifice his own life. He placed the remote detonation device on the nap of old N's neck, explaining that he had taken care of any potential evidence but couldn't guarantee that Tien wouldn't find any clues leading back to him. He reassured old N that he had ensured the device wouldn't explode, so there was no need to worry. They then entered the farm, and old Nan called out to Han Han, who was occupied with something. Old Nan couldn't believe his eyes when he saw that they had a robot dog inside the excavator, along with many hands and feet. He also noticed that even a young girl like Han Han wasn't scared, which made him question his sanity. Han Han responded in a panicked manner, claiming she was just playing a video game and hadn't caused any explosions. Stating that he had witnessed everything and asked why she was lying. Han Han admitted that she was afraid her older brother would dislike her for being a violent child and wondered if he didn't want her anymore. Assured her that it was nonsense and insisted that her big brother could never stop loving her. She then confessed that she had caused someone's death, leaving old Nan surprised and pondering if that was the reason. He reassured her that no matter what mistakes she made, he would always be by her side to face them together. He emphasized that she was his most important family member, gently holding her face and expressing his happiness that she knew how to protect herself. He encouraged her to be true to herself, promising to guide her so that she wouldn't be burdened. He also commended her for dealing with those who had evil intentions, saying that if they didn't harm others, they couldn't prevent them from causing harm. In response, Han Han proudly declared that she would protect her big brother from anyone who dared to bully him, even if it meant taking drastic measures. Old Nan playfully agreed, stating that he would do the same. This realization made Old Nan acknowledge that the world was rapidly changing, and he needed to adapt to it. Shortly after, 
He asked Han Han if she meant that she saw those people with a red color and that's why she wanted to harm them. Han Han nodded and explained that they had even knocked down the gate and interrupted her while she was watching cartoons. She also mentioned that she didn't like the color red because it appeared unsettling to her. He inquired if others also had colors associated with them, besides those people. Han Han confirmed that they did and described her brother's color as a relaxing blue, Xiao Hei's as approachable green, and Xiao Tian's as red. She mentioned that old Nan's color was gray with some green, and there were also passers-by she had seen before who were gray. He realized that people exhibiting the red color had something in common, they all harbored ill intentions toward Han Han. Panicking, he asked Han Han if she saw anything else around people, such as words or numbers, in addition to the different colors. He speculated that Han Han might also be a player. Han Han replied that she didn't see anything like that, and asked when she started seeing colors on people. She said it began about a week ago, leading him to realize that Han Han's ability emerged after the start of the destruction season. However, Han Han couldn't see the system, so she definitely wasn't a player. It was likely that her abilities evolved after consuming radiation-resistant vegetables. While he playfully pinched Han Han's cheek, she fell silent, knowing that her brother did this whenever he pondered a problem. She told him that his smile was quite unsettling. He explained that he was genuinely happy and that the crops redeemed by the food system didn't have the same side effects as the radiation-contaminated crops out in the world. However, the probability of mutation was higher with the redeemed crops. They had only been consuming radiation-resistant food for a few days, and their physical well-being had significantly improved. Han Han had developed the ability to sense other people's emotions, essentially becoming a human reconnaissance device. As he continued to pinch her cheek, Han Han felt a twinge of pain, fearing that her cheeks would swell. He explained that his digital ability was called, the Eye of Truth, while Han Han's ability was known as, the Eye of Good and Evil. He praised her for her useful ability and assured her that she would be able to help in the future. He instructed her that if she ever saw someone with a red color in the future, she should immediately inform him because she would be his strongest assistant. He patted her, filling her with pride, and then asked if she was hungry. Excitedly, she replied, yes. Shortly after, the food was ready, and as they sat at the table, he told Han Han that old Nan would be living with them from now on and could help with farm work. Old Nan mentioned that he wasn't fully aware of the situation yet but would do whatever they said. Han Han exclaimed that it was great because she would have more time to watch cartoons. She also inquired about where old Nan would live. Old Nan replied that he would build a thatched hut at the gate to live in and keep an eye on it. Curious about her brother Xiao Tian and when he would live with them, Han Han asked old Nan. Old Nan broke down in sadness but managed to tell her that Xiao Tian had gone to another world to atone for his sins. Han Han cheerfully exclaimed that those who had harmed her big brother or Xiao Hei wouldn't live long. She vowed that she would have to buy blow their heads off. Impressed by her cleverness, he told her to focus on eating. Old Nan thought it couldn't get any worse than it was at that moment, and his hands were already stained with blood. He believed that as long as he could help his son get revenge, he was willing to be Tian Ran's watchman. Meanwhile, in some houses, a man was smoking a cigar while watching a woman on television announce that it had been 15 days since the catastrophe, with a cumulative death toll of 38.6 million in Blue Star and 4.7 million in the Yunnan Federation. She mentioned that the federal government was actively transferring grain reserves and that soulless cultivation technology would be put into large-scale production. Someone turned off the television, and the man, referred to as, the old man, addressed the man smoking the cigar as, father, and asked what he could do for him. The old man inquired if he had read Reno's report. The man confirmed that he had seen it and learned that Tianu was dead. The old man informed the man that Tianu had been a significant earner and that the mutation process had now accelerated. The military police headquarters had captured a level 5 mutated beast in the mountains of the southern border. The head office researcher, Jingyan, questioned how a level 5 mutant beast had evolved when their current research level was only at level 3 or the result of artificial catalysis. The old man explained that in the deep forests with no human intervention, radioactive vegetation was abundant, and even the lowest level species cannibalized each other, intensifying the mutation process. He also noted that humanity's current technology was vulnerable to unknown natural evolution. The old man directed Jingyan to take over the laboratory, as Ren Xiao had discovered that Tianu's secret experiments involved intriguing technologies. 
he suggested combining these technologies with their current resources and extracting the virus as soon as possible, Jingyan responded with an affirmative yes. Meanwhile, in the company, Ren Xiao realized that the records prior to those two days appeared completely normal. It seemed that the cause of Tianu's death lay within those two days, but Tianu had deleted the surveillance records for that period, leaving no clues. Ren Xiao understood that dwelling on this issue would be fruitless and instead needed to decide on the location of the new research institute and welcome the new person in charge. Ren Xiao left her office and went outside, where a car pulled up in front of the building. Jingyan emerged from the car, and people welcomed him to the southern side. He introduced himself to Ren Xiao as Bian, and she introduced herself to him as well. She asked about the man standing next to him, and he explained that it was his assistant. Jingyan mentioned that he had heard she had a rough location for the new research institute and asked if she could show it to him. She readily agreed, mentioning that she had selected a couple of places on the outskirts of the city, allowing him to choose one. Meanwhile, on the farm, Tian Ran opened the livestock section in the system and selected the fish option. He saw the various fish levels, the points required to purchase them, and the required levels. He clicked on the level 1 fish, and the system displayed level 1 salmon, blue and tuna, trout, mackerel, herring, sardines, and more. He marveled at the variety of fish, noting that the points required for different types of fish at the same level were the same. He focused on the blue and tuna, a rare pre-apocalyptic ingredient now available for 500 points. He asked Han Han if she would like to eat a lot of blue and tuna, and she excitedly inquired about its cost, describing it as the red fish that melts in their mouths. He confirmed that it was expensive but mentioned that they now had the means to afford it, and they could eat as much as they wanted. She was amazed and eagerly expressed her desire to eat it. Tian Ran put on his jacket, grabbed his shovel, and suggested they let Dubai operate the excavator to dig a fish pond together. Han Han enthusiastically agreed. A moment later, Tian Ran drew a circular line on the ground and instructed them to start digging there. Old Nan asked how old Xiao Hei was because it seemed significantly larger than before. Tian Ran replied that it couldn't be the case because Xiao Hei had already reached adulthood and wasn't supposed to grow anymore. Old Nan wondered if it could be the result of the farm's high-quality food causing weight gain. He recalled when he first arrived to help on the farm, remembering that Xiao Hei only reached up to his knees, but now it extended to his thighs. Upon hearing this, Tian Ran realized that old Nan was correct. They spent every day together, and he hadn't noticed the changes in Xiao Hei's body shape. He feared that sudden changes in Xiao Hei's body might lead to a mutation similar to Xiao Bai. Since they disposed of all poisonous crops on the farm following Xiao Bai accident, he wondered if Xiao Hei might have evolved from consuming radiation-resistant crops like Han Han. Therefore, he decided to keep a close watch on Xiao Hei to prevent any further incidents. Suddenly, the system alerted Tian Ran about the presence of visitors, causing him to immediately look back, wondering who they were. The old man asked him what had happened, and the system identified the visitors as two men and one woman with a threat level of eight. Ren Xiao asked Jingyan if he truly needed to inspect the new location she had selected, which offered better equipment and improved security. Jingyan replied that the current location of the farm was excellent and adequately sized, and they could transfer the security and equipment after purchasing the farm. He expressed satisfaction with their current location. Ren Xiao agreed and instructed him to proceed as he wished. However, she found it challenging to communicate with him, noting that he hadn't even considered the carefully chosen locations she had suggested. She informed him that it had been a while since anyone had shown up, and she didn't believe they would show up this time. Nevertheless, he ordered Da Kui to continue knocking. Tian Ran asked the visitors about their intentions, and Jingyan inquired if he was the owner of the place because he had some business to discuss. Jingyan then asked if he could open the gate to enable a face-to-face -face conversation, but Tian Ran declined and urged them to speak where they were. He insisted that they should speak quickly as he was very busy. Jingyan acknowledged the chaotic situation outside, leaving Ren Xiao wondering about Tian Ran's attitude. She cleared her throat and introduced herself as the general manager of Tianren Company, Ren Xiao. She presented her card and stated that they wanted to purchase his farm, allowing him to name his price. Tian Ran couldn't believe that Tianan had already found his farm, while Ren Xiao encouraged him to name his price for supplies or anything else, assuring him that they would meet his request. She even offered a discounted place in a villa in the city center if he needed it. However, he replied that there was no need for it. 
Ren Xiao asked if he didn't want to hear the price, considering their reputation in the southern region. She suggested that he might change his mind after learning the offer, but he remained steadfast, expressing his love for living there and stating that not even a mountain of gold would change his mind. Suddenly, Da Kui slammed his hands on the gate forcefully, and the system warned Tian Ran that it detected a minor attack at the farm gate with an attack strength of 2, asking if he wanted to counterattack. He ordered the system not to attack, realizing that Da Kui's action had triggered the system warning with just one slam. Jingyan shouted at Da Kui, causing him to look back with concern. Then, Jingyan slapped Da Kui hard in the face, reminding him that he seemed to have forgotten what he was taught. He warned Da Kui that if he acted without permission again, he'd be sent back to the devil's capital. Da Kui apologized to Jingyan, admitting his mistake and swearing that he wouldn't do it again. Tian Ran smiled, finding Jingyan's response interesting. Jingyan told him not to take it to heart, explaining that his subordinate had acted out of ignorance. But Tian Ran suggested they ignore it and called Da Kui over. Confused, Da Kui walked toward him as instructed, and suddenly, Tian Ran punched Da Kui in the stomach, implanting the hummingbird guard inside him, causing Da Kui to kneel on the ground in pain. Tian Ran told Da Kui that he had punched his gate, so he punched his back, and now they were even. Then, he suggested that if there was nothing else, they should leave. Jingyan simply smiled, but then Jingyan snapped the paper with a number, apologizing for the inconvenience they had caused him. He handed the paper to Tian Ran, telling him that it was his phone number and that if he ever changed his mind, he could contact him at any time. Tian Ran looked at them in silence, which made Ren Xiao think he was rude and that he definitely wouldn't answer. However, he snatched the paper from Jingyan's hand, shocking Ren Xiao. She told herself not to look down on them as they left. Jingyan told Tian Ran that he would see him again. Tian Ran looked at the paper and didn't expect the people from Tianran to find his farm so quickly, wondering if they were actively searching for him or if it was just an accident. He threw the paper away, and the system showed him that it had retrieved Hummingbird Guard Number 1. He saw Jingyan's truck driving away and he knew that there were only about 10 days left before the next construction season, and the output of the plantation area was stable. The digging of the aquatic area had also begun, but they still needed to develop a livestock area. Later, he finished preparing the food, and Han Han happily told him to try the sesame sauce she made because it was super delicious. He put his meat in the sauce and exclaimed that it was yummy, making Han Han proud of herself. She mentioned that in winter, they should eat mutton hot pot. He found it warm and fuzzy, and she sweetly agreed. Old Nan asked them if they were a little underdressed and mentioned that the current land could no longer be cultivated, so eating so extravagantly seemed a bit excessive. He told Old Nan that he must have been curious for a long time, but he couldn't tell him any more details. Old Nan said he understood and shouldn't have asked in the first place because he had his secrets. However, Tian Ran disagreed and told Old Nan that he just wanted him to be mentally prepared. He added that the food they had there was not ordinary and that long-term consumption of it would cause some changes in the body, like improved immunity, physical fitness, and even the possibility of developing unusual abilities. He looked forward to those changes. Old Nan asked him what it was and commented that it sounded like a science fiction movie. Tian Ran reminded Old Nan that he had said the apocalypse was just like a science fiction movie come true. He explained that if it wasn't for fossils, it would have been hard for mankind to imagine that the blue star was once home to those huge prehistoric beasts. Given that, having superpowers in this context didn't seem strange at all, it was more like an evolution. Old Nan admitted that he didn't understand what Tian Ran was talking about, and Tian Ran told him to just continue his dinner. Old Nan asked if someone had come today, and Tian Ran replied that they were from Tianran. This shocked Old Nan, who angrily snapped his chopstick. He asked if a useless old man like him could get stronger by eating the food from that farm. Tian Ran confidently replied, of course, and old Nan sighed with relief, saying that he understood. After dinner, Tian Ran instructs everyone to rest early while he goes out to run some errands. He hops on his motorcycle, and the system notifies him of the location of the hummingbird number one. The target is in the Harmony Villa district. Meanwhile, in the villa, Ren Xiao informs Jingyan that it is her house and offers to let him stay there for the night. However, she promises to arrange a new place for him tomorrow. Jingyan expresses his gratitude and apologizes for the trouble. As the hummingbird guard enters the villa, Ren Xiao informs him that he will stay downstairs and can choose from one of the four available rooms. 
She assures him that dinner will be delivered to his room. He thanks her, and as she walks upstairs, he suggests that she should also rest early. While walking up, Ren Xiao becomes annoyed by the presence of the hummingbird flying around her, questioning why mosquitoes would be present in such cold weather. After taking a refreshing shower, she wraps a towel around her hair and looks at herself in the mirror. She acknowledges her exhaustion from the long day but also recognizes her beauty and competence in her job. She playfully wonders if she should leave some space for others and lightly slaps her face during her skincare routine. However, the buzzing sound of the hummingbird irritates her again. Irritated, she walks toward the window, realizing that the sound resembles that of a beetle. Curious, she decides to open the window to see if it can fly out. Enjoying the refreshing air, she suddenly notices Tianu climbing up with a rope. They are both shocked to see each other, and before Ren Xiao can react, Tianu jumps into the room, further surprising her. He quickly covers her mouth. To prevent her from shouting for help, causing her to feel frustrated by the ineffectiveness of the bodyguards outside. She contemplates firing them and realizes that Tianu is incredibly strong, leaving her unable to move or fight back. Understanding that she needs to calm the situation, she signals her agreement with Tianu's demand for silence and warns him not to underestimate the speed of the bodyguards outside, as his knife might not be faster. Once he releases his grip, Ren Xiao informs him that there is money, jewelry, and gold in the bedside cabinet, assuring him he can take it all as long as he doesn't harm her. She promises not to involve the police. Tianu acknowledges her cooperation, but surprises her by revealing that he is not there to rob her. Astonished, she questions if he is a pervert, psychologically disturbed, or involved in pornography. She also warns him that she has AIDS, implying that he would be at risk if he touched her. She is about to question the relevance of such a thought when he covers her mouth and tells her to stop talking. He then asks her if she sent someone to kill Tianu and why it took her so long to uncover the murderer, making her wonder if it was not a simple robbery. He removes his hand from her mouth, and she asks if he is one of Tianu's men, considering that all of Tianu's confidants are deceased. She wonders where this person could have come from. In response, he explains that Tianu did him a great favor but died under mysterious circumstances. He seeks revenge for Tianu's death. Learning that she is currently investigating the cause of Tianu's demise, he asks her to share any information she has, as he wants to take a look. She realizes that he is there to voice his accusations and informs him that she and the police are investigating Tianu's death. However, the clues are scarce, and it is challenging to identify the true culprit in such a short time frame. He suggests that since she assumed Tianu's position after his death, she could be a suspect. She argues that he has no evidence, and considering Tianu's numerous enemies, it is only natural for someone to take advantage of the chaos and kill him. She adds that Chu's death was also tragic, likely a revenge killing, and she had no personal grudge against Tianu, making it unlikely for her to murder him for the general manager position. He acknowledges that she is essentially correct and realizes she is not foolish. However, he expresses disbelief that they have no suspects. She explains that Tianu destroyed all documents and surveillance related to the recent conspiracy, making it difficult to identify suspects. She asks him how she is supposed to pinpoint a suspect when she doesn't even know who Tianu was interacting with before his death, mentioning her own struggles in that regard. He is relieved that Tianu wanted to keep everything to himself and left no clues. Suddenly, they hear footsteps approaching, and someone asks Ren Xiao what is happening, urging her to open the door. In the midst of the commotion, he attacks her neck while Da Kui tries to open the door. Ren Xiao's housemate informs Da Kui that the alarm system has been triggered, indicating that something has happened, and pleads with Da Kui to save Ren Xiao. Da Kui manages to break the door and rushes inside with the housemate. They find Ren Xiao collapsed on the ground, and the housemate holds her, tearfully asking what is wrong. Meanwhile, Da Kui runs straight to the window and shouts for MD, instructing him not to let the man escape. However, by the time he reaches the ground, he lands safely, leaving Da astonished that the door was breached by the scar-faced monster. Someone comments that breaking into a girl's bedroom in the middle of the night is quite rude. When he turns around, he sees Jingyan standing behind him. He questions how Jingyan found him when he left no trace behind. Jingyan argued that he noticed the gravity sensing device on the window and asked Da Kui to block the door. He deduced that if the intruder wanted to avoid a direct confrontation, they would surely jump out of the window as an escape route. He fell silent, 
Realizing that Jingyun was exceptionally smart, he swiftly ran toward Jingyun, wondering if this seemingly weaker person could stop him. He attempted to punch Jingyun, but Jingyun raised his knee, blocking Jingyun's fist with his knee, surprising him. Jingyun then leapt away from him. Jingyun's knee was slightly injured, and Jingyun remarked that it was interesting because the bones of the arm were nothing compared to the knee. According to Jingyun's calculations, his forearm's ulna and radius should be fractured from the frontal impact force of 700 kg, and his carpal joints should be crushed and dislocated due to their inability to withstand that force. However, Jingyun showed no signs of injury. Jingyun asked if he had ever practiced martial arts, noting that he didn't see him using any special techniques. Jingyun asked for an answer because he was confused. He warned Jingyun that he wasn't going anywhere tonight, leaving shocked, his hand shaking in pain. He looked at Jingyun in silence, wondering if Jingyun had ever practiced martial arts because he couldn't believe Jingyun had actually stopped his punch, knew that even though his current body's capabilities were beyond those of a normal human, it was still troublesome to be entangled with someone who could fight. Suddenly, they heard someone saying that there were sounds coming from their direction, prompting them to investigate, apologized to Jingyun, saying he didn't have time to play with him and threatened that the next time they met, he'd beat him to death. However, he was surprised when Jingyun leapt toward him, ready to attack. Jingyun's eyes were then hit with sand, causing Jingyun to close his eyes in pain and cough on the ground. This gave chance to run away. While running, told Jingyun that he was leaving and advised him to go back and wash his eyes. Jingyun turned around, shouting that despicable, but his damaged eyes prevented him from seeing Jingyun properly. As he bid farewell, he landed outside the villa, the bodyguards rushed toward Jingyun, who was still coughing. They asked if he was okay, and Jingyun tried to stand up, thinking that Tian Ran was very smart and in perfect physical condition, almost beyond human limits, which made him excellent material. In his mind, Jingyun told Tian Ran to wait because he would find him. Jingyun told the bodyguards that he was fine and just needed to wash his eyes. When asked if they should go after the man, Jingyun told them not to because he was very fast and they wouldn't be able to catch him. He then asked about Ren Xiao's condition and ordered them to check on her. The next morning, he checked on Ren Xiao's condition and told the maid that it wasn't serious since the intruder had only knocked her out. He instructed her to take the pills from the medicine cabinet, with the dosage already written on them. The maid suggested calling the police, but he declined, citing the chaotic situation in the southern side and the absence of stolen property. He didn't want to cause trouble for their comrades in the army and police force. The maid agreed and expressed gratitude for his assistance. Suddenly, Da Kui appeared and informed Jingyun that there was bad news. He had checked his room and found that a hard drive was missing. He inquired of Da Kui whether it was the gray hard drive, which had been connected to his computer. Da Kui confirmed that it was indeed the same hard drive. Unbeknownst to them, Tian Ran had taken it with him the previous night and brought it back home. Meanwhile, on the farm, Tian Ran contemplated disconnecting the network cable to avoid any issues and to see what the Tian and company intended to do. He plugged the hard drive into his laptop and noticed a file titled, Experiment Notes, which made him wonder if Jingyun was a researcher. As he opened the folder and read its contents, he discovered that despite numerous creatures perishing, Jingyun firmly believed that the world had become a better place than before. It became evident to Tian Ran that the document was not confidential and originated from Tianran. He continued reading other notes, which stated that radioactive foods that caused drastic changes in limbs and body shapes were not inherently catastrophic. They brought about more than just death and deformity, they brought evolution. Another note suggested that they had merely taken the wrong path of evolution, resulting in premature deaths. Jingyun was determined to find the right path, even at the cost of human life, in order to lead humanity into the next civilization. In that future, humans would not be separated due to terminal illnesses, Premature births due to congenital anomalies, are considered liabilities due to a lack of strength. They would possess the strength to rival tigers, leopards, and even gods, living up to 300 years. Regardless of the outcome, death or supreme glory would await them at the end of the road. Back at the villa, Da Kui informed Jingyun that they had yet to find any leads. Jingyun speculated that the other party may have employed some means or had not yet examined the contents of the hard drive. He mentioned that the mother disc was not receiving any signals from the daughter disc. Da Kui questioned if the information was crucial, frustrating Jingyun. Jingyun told Da Kui to forget about it, stating that the hard drive mainly contained old data that would be difficult for outsiders to comprehend. However, 
Jingyan knew that if those individuals were to come across his notes, they might deduce that he had come to the southern side for something real. Da Kui remarked that it was too coincidental that they were attacked upon their arrival and asked if it could be the work of Number 7. Jingyan responded that if Number 7 truly intended to act against them, they would not have dispatched such an inexperienced person. That individual possessed remarkable physical fitness but lacked refined skills. On the other hand, Tian Ran read Jingyan's notes, which mentioned that darkness lay ahead, with an abyss behind him, leaving no possibility of turning back. The notes were dated November 21, 2025, according to the Yan Wang calendar and attributed to Jingyan. This realization made Tian Ran contemplate whether human experiments had already begun. The following day, Han Han affectionately referred to Tian Ran as, Big Brother, while admiring Level 1 Bama Yong Pig Cub, Level 1 Wiser Rabbit Cub, and Level 1 Kingu and Chicken Cub. She asked where he had obtained all these adorable little creatures. Tian Ran pondered his response, knowing that a complicated explanation might not be easily understood by Han Han. While Han Han showered affection on the bunny, Xiao He couldn't help but feel jealous. He told her that he possessed a hidden treasure called the Doran Treasure, which allowed him to retrieve anything he desired. Excitedly, Han Han asked if it was true, acknowledging him as her big brother. He made it clear that it was a secret between them, and she couldn't share it with anyone else. Han Han immediately agreed, demonstrating her quick understanding. However, Xiao He noticed that the bunny was covered in crayons and advised Han Han not to play with the precious food. He urged her to return it to the shed promptly. Han Han was shocked to learn that it was meant for consumption and tearfully expressed that it was too cute to eat. She wanted to keep it since it was still so small. Xiao He countered by suggesting that he could cook spicy rabbit meat with it. Witnessing Han Han's reaction, he proceeded to describe various dishes like pork chopped rice, chicken pot, pork bacon burger, spicy rabbit pot, chicken rice, grilled chicken leg, Saudi diced rabbit with pickled pepper and rice, and ginger rabbit. This overwhelmed Han Han, freezing her in place. He then informed her that if she didn't want to cook the rabbit, she would have to become a vegetarian. Frowning, Han Han tried to disagree, he playfully told her to appreciate the hard-earned food and eat it without leaving a single bite. He emphasized that it was the greatest respect for food and that building a relationship with it could be rewarding. After a brief moment of contemplation, Han Han ultimately gave him the rabbit, pledging to eat every bit of it. Suddenly, the system congratulated Shay on the rare albino corn produced on his plantation. He was advised to harvest it promptly, leaving him curious about its properties. Instructing Han Han to go play, he headed to the cornfield where he discovered the rare item, level 2 albino corn. The description revealed that it was an extremely rare mutated product with a probability of 1 in 100,000. When consumed, it induced a state of rage, increasing strength, speed, and reflexes by tenfold for 30 seconds. Amazed by its potential, picked it up, likening it to Popeye's spinach. He wondered if it was the only one and contemplated searching for more rare products on his farm. However, upon inspection, he found nothing else. Realizing that finding such rare items required luck, he acknowledged that intensive farming might be necessary to increase his chances. Nevertheless, he reminded himself to focus on farming honestly and not get too carried away with the idea of rare products, as his primary goal was to accumulate points. Rare items were merely an added bonus. Meanwhile, in Ren Xiao's house, she was in her bedroom, engrossed in watching the CCTV footage from the previous night. Filled with anger, she cursed Tian Ran as a despicable bastard and vowed to dig him up and cut him into pieces. She expressed her frustration towards the security guards, calling them a bunch of idiots, as they failed to catch a single thief despite their numbers. The military and police were unable to spare additional manpower for the investigation, leaving Ren Xiao to realize that she couldn't rely on official means to uncover the identity of the person responsible. Reflecting on the hair she found in a plastic bag, she concluded that it didn't belong to her since it was too light. She believed it must have come from the man who attacked her that night. Trying to push thoughts of the assailant out of her mind, she reaffirmed her determination to apprehend him. Leaving her room, she approached Jingyan, who was sitting on the sofa, and informed him that she needed to talk. Jingyan inquired about her well-being, and she thanked him for the effective massage technique he had taught her, which alleviated her pain. Ren Xiao then revealed that she had already chosen a location for his research institute. It was a former factory near the farm, which had closed down and been sold to them at a low price due to unforeseen circumstances. 
The location was secluded and met Jingyan's requirements perfectly. Apologizing for the trouble, Jingyan sensed that there was more to her visit. Ren Xiao admitted that the matter was somewhat embarrassing, but she believed that Jingyan, being an expert in biological research, could assist her in conducting a DNA analysis to find a match for the hair she discovered. Jingyan explained the challenges involved in comparing DNA samples from the entire southern side of the area, likening it to finding a needle in a haystack. Moreover, the process would be time-consuming, considering the nearly 100,000 copies to be examined. He questioned the importance of this person to Ren Xiao, to which she awkwardly responded that it wasn't of great significance, she simply wanted to identify the intruder who attacked her. Recognizing the difficulty of the task, Ren Xiao suggested giving up on the idea. However, Jingyan was taken aback by her statement and vehemently declared that it wasn't difficult at all. Excitedly, he offered his help in the matter, leaving Ren Xiao perplexed but grateful. Later, in the laboratory, the system indicated that the reagent injection solution had been prepared. After administering the reagent to the experimental subject, the system observed a significant thickening of muscle fibers and a thousand-fold increase in cellular activity. As the subject's appearance slowly changed, compound eyes emerged, indicating contamination of the subject's genes by other organisms. Breaking free from its restraints, the experimental subject entered a violent state, prompting a warning from the system. The subject relentlessly struck the glass, causing it to shatter, as the system indicated the failure of the B34 virus experiment. Immediate destruction protocols were activated, resulting in the subject's immediate termination. Meanwhile, in Ren Xiao's house, Jingyan observed several official individuals walking around, with a child named Jingming in the center. The child questioned Jingming about leaving his pathetic little brother alone. Jingming dismissed the claim, stating that the child was not his little brother but merely a bastard. While Jingyan stood apart from the group, Jingming suggested teasing him to the other kids, and they agreed. Shortly after, the kids were playfully drowning Jingyan in the fountain, laughing and encouraging each other to hold him tightly and make him drink until he was full, emphasizing his status as a disgraceful bastard. Jingming cautioned the kids not to leave any visible marks on V, reminding them that despite being a bastard, Jingyan carried the family name and had to live up to their father's expectations. The kids responded with laughter, acknowledging their understanding. In the midst of Jingyan's painful coughing, Jingyan's pleaded with his older brother Jingming to let him go, but the child mockingly informed Jingming that Jingyan had even referred to him as his brother. This angered Jingming, who called Jingyan a filthy bastard. Startled, Jingyan woke up in a sweat, immediately sitting up and shouting for them not to hurt him. He placed his hand on his head in frustration, catching his breath. Looking at the injection, he remarked to Jingming that V-shaped viruses had become more stable nowadays. He expressed his confidence that once he could create the perfect mutant, he wouldn't be far from surpassing Jingming. Meanwhile, in the news, a reporter announced that it had been 19 days since the world changed. Reporters relayed that a large number of mutated livestock carcasses of unknown origin had been discovered in Nakai town, surpassing the authorities' capacity. The Epidemic Prevention Department had already disposed of the remains, wired why Han Han wasn't watching cartoons and if she had started following the news. Han Han replied that she didn't want to be treated like a child all the time and had been keeping up with the news, as she couldn't rely on him to protect her forever. He acknowledged that she could sense people's evil intentions, which had already been helpful to him. However, she expressed her desire to grow up quickly and assist him more, especially with the increasing strength of Xiao Hei. Noting that he had been observing Xiao Hei for a while and it hadn't shown signs of going berserk. Any changes in its body shape were likely due to its evolution through anti-radiation products, which put him at ease. He informed Han Han that he and her uncle Nan would continue digging the pond, and she should find snacks for herself when she got hungry. An hour later, Han Han lay on Xiao Hei, sulking that her big brother had been right because she was feeling a little hungry. She then noticed something on the table, arousing her curiosity. Upon opening it, she found the level 4 divine gain seeds, which appeared as glowing nuts to her and looked delicious. She showed them to Xiao Hei, mentioning that there were two, one for each of them. She fed one to Xiao Hei but spat out her own because it tasted bitter. While still holding Xiao Hei's mouth, she exclaimed that the nut was too hard and she needed to rinse her mouth. However, Xiao Hei swallowed it whole, leaving her surprised. Shortly after, Xiao Hei began to feel drowsy and closed its eyes. Suddenly, the inside of the house was destroyed, 
and a dog's continuous barking caught Nan's attention. Curious, Nan went to investigate the source of the sound and followed a trail of blood, leading him to a peculiar sight. Xiao He looked back at Nan with a menacing glare, shocking him. Without warning, Xiao He lunged at Nan, opening its mouth to attack him. Nan managed to dodge just in time, dropping his flashlight in the process. Nan turned around to see what had attacked him and realized it was Xiao He. As he observed the creature, he noticed that Xiao He had transformed into a wolf-like form, making him wonder if it was due to mutation. However, he also realized that Xiao He seemed different from other mutant animals and showed no further signs of aggression. Determined to calm Xiao He down, Nan tried to approach it while asking if it was hungry and promising to get it food. However, Xiao He softly barked at him as a warning, leaving Nan stunned. Xiao He then jumped out of the window, surprising Nan, who called out for it repeatedly. Xiao He paused for a moment and then leapt over the fence effortlessly. Nan couldn't believe that Xiao He had climbed such a high fence with ease. Tian ran towards Nan and asked what had happened. Nan explained that Xiao He had suddenly gone crazy and ran outside for unknown reasons. He mentioned that Xiao He didn't behave like the other mutant animals because it seemed to recognize him, which surprised him. Just then, Han Han approached them and informed them that Xiao He was missing because it wasn't by her bed when she woke up. Concerned, Tian Ran asked why she was outside and told her not to worry, assuring her that Xiao He would likely return after running around for a while. He suggested she go back to sleep. However, Han Han insisted that Xiao He never left her side while she slept and asked Nan what he meant by going crazy. Tian Ran questioned why she had come there without wearing shoes, and Han Han jumped at him, explaining that she was worried about Xiao He. She asked what would happen if Xiao He became like Xiao Bai. Tian Ran advised her not to overthink and inquired if Xiao He had eaten anything special recently. Han Han confidently replied that they had only eaten farm food from Nan's box, which contained glowing nuts in the afternoon. Tian Ran wondered if it could be the level 4 divine gain seeds. He realized that Xiao He must have evolved, but he questioned why it had gone crazy and if consuming the level 4 grain seeds had the side effect of causing the creatures to lose control. He made multiple attempts to contact the system for answers, but it remained unresponsive. Frustrated, he informed Han Han that he would go and retrieve Xiao He, assuring her that she should go back to bed and not worry. Han Han insisted that he must bring Xiao He back and he reassured her that he would definitely retrieve their family member. Meanwhile, Xiao He was running outside at high speed, feeling hot and craving fresh meat. However, it knew it couldn't harm humans as it wanted to return to its young master. Unbeknownst to Xiao He, someone hiding behind a tree observed it and recognized it as a sacred animal, possibly the one mentioned in the oracle. The person believed that bringing back Xiao He would please the gods. In another part of the forest, a patrol level surveillance guard reported that Xiao He couldn't be found, indicating that it had left the area. Realizing the urgency of the situation, he knew he had to retrieve Xiao He quickly before the military police discovered it, which would likely result in its death. Suddenly, he sensed someone behind him and turned around to inquire about the person's identity. It was an old woman who asked if he was searching for a black wolf dog and whether it was his. He found the woman strange but asked her if she had seen which way Xiao He went. The old woman responded by asking if he knew the truth behind the apocalypse. He dismissed her question and requested that she simply tell him where his dog had gone, as he had no interest in anything else. However, the old woman became agitated and shouted that the disasters were a punishment for humanity's evil deeds and that they would continue until the human race was wiped out. She urged him to join their self-help society, make a sincere confession to God, and have a chance of survival. He considered the old woman's words to be a new missionary scam and asked if there were any conditions for joining their society. The old woman explained that membership levels had different fees ranging from 3 to 300,000, with higher levels offering closer proximity to God and a greater chance of salvation. As the master of the sacred animal, he could simply bring Xiao He to join the club. He brushed off her claims, suggesting that she should learn more about brainwashing and deception before attempting to fool people. The old woman became angry and accused him of disrespecting God. He apologized and stated that he didn't have time to engage in games with her. He asked if salvation could be achieved through piety and then drove away, asserting that he would be the one to save himself. The old woman warned him that those who didn't believe in God would suffer eternal damnation in hell, being the lowest of the low-like maggots. 
he remembered a moment when he had stopped on the side of the road to smoke and heard barking nearby. Investigating the sound, he discovered a dead dog with its own blood and a surviving puppy. He assumed the mother dog had been dead for several days, likely hit by a car while crossing the road. He gazed at the wounded creature for a moment and reassured it that there were many others who had lost their parents, urging it to come home with him. Meanwhile, deep in the forest, Xiao He growled while biting someone's leg, drawing the attention of a group of men. One of the men shouted to his comrade, suggesting that they provoke Xiao since it wouldn't be able to hold on much longer. Just then, Jingyan emerged from a nearby building and questioned the men about how the mutated beast had managed to enter. One of the men explained that Xiao had become addicted to smoking and had gone into the woods to indulge in the habit. When he flicked his cigarette butt at the creature, it became aggressive and attacked him. Jingyan expressed his disbelief at their actions, and the man clarified that the beast had been hiding in the bushes, unseen by Xiao. They had already contacted the military police to handle the situation. Jingyan confirmed that low-level mutant beasts tend to wander aimlessly, following the heat of living creatures, implying that Xiao He must be a high-level mutant beast. Furthermore, it had only bitten the security guard's leg without killing him, suggesting that it understood the danger of guns and was using the guard as a shield. Jingyan realized that capturing and studying Xiao He could potentially provide insights into the instability of the V-Virus, making it the perfect mutant beast he had been searching for. He ordered the men to gather as many people as possible, equipped with tranquilizer guns and sedatives, emphasizing the importance of capturing the creature alive before the military police arrived. One of the men handed Jingyan a tranquilizer gun, and he instructed them to aim for the limbs and be cautious. He aimed his gun and fired at Xiao He, but the creature noticed in time and evaded the shot. They continued shooting tranquilizers at Xiao He, managing to graze it, causing the creature to retaliate and attack one of the men in pain. Frustrated, Jingyan reloaded his gun and heard someone shout that Xiao He was attempting to escape. Xiao He leapt away, and Jingyan ordered the men to pursue it. In another part of the forest, Hummingbird No. 2 reported to Chan Ran that they had found large dog paw prints 700 meters southeast. Chan Ran swiftly headed there on his motorcycle and was shocked to discover the paw prints stained with fresh blood. He deduced that they likely belonged to Xiao He and wondered what had caused the severe injuries. Meanwhile, three cars chased after Xiao He. Jingyan, inside one of the cars, realized that no ordinary mutated animal could move at such a remarkable speed, fueling his excitement. He observed Xiao He's muscular physique as it ran and acknowledged its beauty. Determined to capture it, Tian Ran, he received a report from Hummingbird that they had located the target. He commanded Hummingbird to zoom in on the tracker's faces, recognizing the presence of the tech nerd once again. This sparked his curiosity about the nerd's intentions and whether he sought to capture Xiao He for research purposes. He quickly rummaged through his inventory and grabbed the albino corn, determined to ensure that those individuals wouldn't escape the consequences. At the same time, Jingyan and his men relentlessly shot at Xiao He while chasing it. Jingyan gave orders for cars 2 and 3 to surround Xiao He from both sides and drive it towards the nearby old factory, hoping to corner it. Xiao He, however, noticed their tactics and leapt higher, skillfully evading their attacks. It landed on one of the cars, using its claws to grab the men inside and biting one of them. The third car reported to Jingyan that the second car had been taken down. One of the men fired his gun at Xiao He, referring to it as a bloody beast. The tranquilizer flew towards Xiao He, momentarily stunning it, but just as the tranquilizer was about to reach its target, a powerful figure intervened, snatching the tranquilizers and revealing the effects of consuming the albino corn. The person activated a frenzy state, with the remaining effect time displayed as 26 seconds. In car number 1, where Jingyan was located, he wondered about the source of the white light while Xiao He seemed to recognize it as its master. Suddenly, Tian Ran vanished with incredible speed, swiftly attacking the enemy as the remaining effect time decreased from 20 seconds to 12 seconds. Jingyan attempted to shoot Tian Ran, questioning what it was, but he was stunned to see the white light in front of him. He attempted to punch Tian Ran, but the attack was blocked in time, causing Jingyan to cough up blood. Eventually, the remaining effect time reached 2 seconds, leaving the person feeling weak. Realizing the negative side effects, Tian Ran jumped away, Jingyan, relieved that he had managed to block the attack. Jingyan pointed his gun at him, considering him too dangerous and contemplating eliminating him. However, Xiao He intervened, biting Jingyan in the neck just as he was about to pull the trigger. The bullet hit Chan Ran, 
but only in the shoulder. Xiao He carried Tian Ran on its back while he regained consciousness. As Xiao He caught its breath in pain, Tian Ran called its name in worry. Attempting to approach Xiao He, Tian Ran was shocked to see the creature shaking uncontrollably and howling. In a panic, he called the system for answers, desperately trying to understand the situation while witnessing Xiao He's suffering. Unbeknownst to him, inside Xiao He's body, the creature's genes had broken due to drinking Jingyan's blood, causing the divine gene to slowly shatter into pieces and release a new gene within Xiao He's body. A massive, glowing web emerged from Xiao He, wrapping around it completely, Tian Ran looked on in panic, realizing the gravity of the situation. Meanwhile, in the hospital, Jingyan lay injured while the doctor expressed apologies for the grim outlook. Jingyan had suffered a severe blow to the head, resulting in a concussion of his pituitary gland and squeezing of the blood vessels in his brain. The fatal wound on his neck added to the critical condition, making it truly miraculous that he had survived this far. The man apologizes to Ren Xiao and informs her that despite their best efforts, Jingyan's chances of survival are very slim. Ren Xiao tells the man not to explain further, stating that it is their duty as guards to protect the researcher's safety at all costs. Jingyan is currently lying on a hospital bed, and his condition is critical and uncertain. The man apologizes to Ren Xiao once again and explains that Jingyan was extremely determined to capture the mutant animal, which prompted him to rush ahead with the advanced team. By the time they arrived, the advanced team had already suffered heavy casualties, with only Da Kui surviving. Ren Xiao interrupts the man, stating that she doesn't want to hear any excuses and asks if he saw the attacker's appearance. The man responds negatively, explaining that it was a fast-moving white light. Ren Xiao angrily rebukes the man, accusing him of fabricating a story and trying to deceive them. The man swears that he is telling the truth and insists he is not lying, but Ren Xiao remains infuriated, reminding him that they have paid a significant amount of money and she is not there to tolerate their evading of responsibilities. Suddenly, the doctor informs Ren Xiao that Jingyan's heart rate is plummeting and there is another hematoma in his brain. She shouts at the doctor to save Jingyan immediately, but the doctor explains that it is futile because Jingyan cannot be saved. The doctor suggests that they listen to Jingyan's final words, leaving everyone stunned. In response, the doctor orders the nurses to administer a shot of adrenaline to Jingyan, which successfully revives him. Jingyan immediately calls Da Kui, who promptly responds. Jingyan instructs Da Kui to inject him with the versus-shaped virus, shocking Da Kui, who expresses disagreement. Jingyan explains to Da Kui that there have been no successful human cases yet, but he is willing to take the risk because he does not want to lose. Da Kui agrees, and the doctor informs them that he will inject 5 milliliters of the versus-shaped virus into Jingyan, while also preparing restraints in a bomb neck collar. The doctor asks Jingyan if he wants him to call the Bai family back, but Jingyan declines, stating that they are merely people who share the same blood and not his true home. Jingyan urges them to proceed, and the doctor administers the versus-shaped virus, causing Jingyan to experience uncontrollable shaking and excruciating pain as the virus alters his DNA. Ren Xiao watches in horror, while Da Kui closes his eyes. Meanwhile, in the forest, the web gradually disintegrates, surprising Tian Ran. He turns around and witnesses the web breaking into pieces, and to his astonishment, Xiao He emerges from it. Xiao He walks out of the web, now resembling a human with hands and feet, leaving Tian Ran stunned. He momentarily questions if it is indeed Xiao He, but Xiao He stares at him and grips his injured shoulder, causing Tian Ran to cry out in pain. The man in the farmhouse advises Han Han to go back to sleep, reassuring her that Xiao He couldn't have gone too far, and Tian Ran would be back soon. Nan, shivering in the cold, expresses concern about catching a cold in such chilly weather. Han Han responds that she is not cold and is in good health, deciding to wait for her brother there. Nan starts to object, but Han Han tells him not to hold her hand if he doesn't believe she's warm. Nan takes her hand and acknowledges that she is indeed warm. They agree to wait for Tian Ran together, with Nan suggesting Han Han sit with him as his, baby warmer, to which she agrees. Hours later, as the sun slowly rises, Han Han wakes up due to the light and exclaims, Big Brother, causing Nan to wake up as well. Han Han rushes to the gate, calling out to Tian Ran and asking if he found Xiao He. However, she stops in amazement and worry when she sees Tian Ran holding onto a huge dog, Xiao He, who has just evolved but still struggles to control his strength. Tian Ran's wounds reopen, and he sustains a fracture. Han Han asks her brother what is wrong with him, observing his condition. 
Later, Han Han excitedly dresses up Xiao Hei with the help of the old Nan. She mentions that Xiao Hei has changed a lot and playfully requests to be lifted up. Xiao Hei, still with his familiar blue color, lifts Han Han, realizing that his mischievous little mistress is still the same. The system displays Xiao Hei's evolution type as atavistic, with an age of 3, a strength of 30, intelligence of 10, speed of 42, spirit of 10, hunger of 5, and an evaluation as a Czech wolf dog with human genes. It notes that he has undergone genetic evolution, and his data will improve significantly, with no upper limit mentioned. This revelation leads to the understanding that Xiao Hei lost control previously due to the atavistic gene, causing him to go berserk and escape, as he didn't want to harm them. The integration with human genes likely occurred during the time Xiao Hei bit Jingyan. Nan informs them that he brought the medicine box and jokingly asks if he should sterilize the knife to dig out the bullet from Tian Ran's shoulder. Tian Ran assures him and proceeds to dig out the bullet with the sterilized knife. He then retrieves ancient medicine grade carrots, surprising Nan with their sudden appearance. Tian Ran consumes the carrot, prompting Nan to wonder if it could be a miraculous cure. Gradually, Tian Ran's skin comes alive, healing the bullet hole in his shoulder. His wound heals, broken bones mend, leaving only residual pain. Tian Ran explains that genetic cells in all living creatures constantly replicate and replace old cells, sustaining life. This process of replication and regeneration allows for healing and restoration. Most of the time, cells remain stable and replicate all elements of the old cell. However, under certain conditions, a new gene may suddenly appear, replacing the original gene, which is known as a mutant gene. Gene mutations can result in two outcomes. The first is beneficial development, like the cases of Han Han and Xiao Hei, where their bodies acquire new and advantageous functions alongside their original functions. This process is referred to as evolution. The second outcome is detrimental development, seen in many mutated animals today. These animals possess tremendously strong limbs and great strength, but their genes have fatal flaws. Even if they are fortunate enough to regain their senses, their lifespan is short-lived, and their existence is merely a survival mechanism. Meanwhile, in the hospital, Jingyan wakes up and effortlessly breaks the chain holding his hand. The doctor exclaims that Jingyan is awake, and Jingyan can hardly believe that he survived. The doctor declares it a miracle since no human has ever retained consciousness after being injected with the V-Virus. The doctor informs Jingyan that his successful survival indicates that their experiment will progress to the next stage. However, Jingyan explains that it's not that simple. Although he survived, the V-shaped virus did not mutate him perfectly. His mutation is still a failure, as he possesses greater strength and speed than ordinary people, but his body structure has been altered for the worse. Furthermore, he reveals that he has a maximum of seven days to live. If he fails to find the perfect mutated creature and obtain its DNA within seven days, his demise is inevitable. Shortly after, Jingyan, who evolved due to the virus, adjusts his clothes when Da Kui arrives and informs him that Detective Yuan from the Southern Side Military Police Bureau is present. Jingyan acknowledges this and Da Kui questions whether it would be appropriate for them to investigate the intruder and alert the military. Jingyan explains that he is highly skilled in various forms of combat, including boxing, Muay Thai, grappling, and Sanu. He possesses a 65-kilogram golden dragon badge from the Federal Sanu Association and his reflexes and physical fitness surpass those of an average adult by more than 2.8 times. In other words, he can already be considered one of the strongest individuals in the world. However, the person who attacked him cannot be considered human at all, as their power source is the same as that of the perfect mutant wolf dog. It is possible that this person is also a perfect mutant, or perhaps their perfect mutations originate from the same source, which would explain why they came to rescue the wolf dog. The attacker's movements remind Jingyan of someone else he encountered before. Da Kui asks if he suspects that these two individuals are the same and whether it would be wise for them to know about their hard-earned research results. Jingyan asserts that he knows what he is doing, and the virus has not yet allowed him to achieve the state of perfect evolution. However, if the information could lead him to the perfect mutant, he is willing to take that risk, as time is running out. He then meets Detective Yuan, and as the lady turns to face him, he apologizes for keeping her waiting in hopes that his appearance hasn't scared her. She informed him that it wasn't the case, and when the senior police officer from the southern side questioned him about the military's interest, he hastily unbuttoned his shirt. While excusing himself to her, he explained that he was in a precarious state, 
as the bone spur would inevitably grow with his body's development. He emphasized that when his heart is pierced, it would lead to his demise, indicating that time was running out. In exchange for her assistance in finding the person, he showed her the hair and urged her to act sooner rather than later. Yawan took a moment to consider before expressing that it was a pleasure working with him. Meanwhile, in their farmhouse, the system revealed to Tian Ran that he had acquired 19 level 4 divine level powerful seeds. Xiao and Han Han were peacefully sleeping as Tian Ran learned that the category of these seeds was cherry tomato, promoting genetic enhancement and preventing negative gene development. Tian Ran reflected on the potential of these seeds to usher in a new era for mankind, contemplating the idea of humans becoming gods. Despite the harsh planning conditions and expensive land upgrades, Tian Ran spent 95,000 points on 19 good land upgrade coupons, transforming his ordinary land into nutrient-rich soil. With the second wave of the destruction season approaching, Tian Ran strategically invested in growth agents and contemplated adding more agricultural robots to expedite the planting process. As he observed his robots working, he recognized the need to save points for upgrading his farm and maximizing crop yields before the impending disaster. Simultaneously, in the city, individuals in robes made their way toward a massive building. The old woman inquired about the possibility of meeting the Holy Lord in her humble human form. The man assured her that she only needed to convey what she had witnessed, and the Holy Lord would pass judgment. Despite not meeting the required number of believers, the old woman could still receive gifts as long as her information was accurate. Grateful and repeatedly expressing her joy, she acknowledged the Holy Lord's benevolence, believing it could sustain her family for another month in the midst of the apocalypse. As they entered the building and reached the center, the man reported to the Holy Lord that the pure sheep had sent a letter indicating the discovery of a new holy beast. The elevated figure, embodying the Holy Lord, gazes at them, and he instructs the subordinate to provide a detailed account. After the man respectfully shares all the information with the Holy Lord, the higher-ranking individual applauds, expressing approval that this revelation will enhance the Holy Lord's power further. The suited man extends congratulations to the Holy Lord for nurturing the new holy beast, and he informs the higher figure that the Holy Lord will soon complete his emergence. Subsequently, the suited man inquires if he can inspect the most recent addition. The higher man responds affirmatively, allowing the suited man to take them away, explaining that the Holy Lord has grown weary of the small treats. All that is required is to bring back the sacred beast and offer it as a sacrifice to the Holy Lord. Suddenly, a sound emanates from the vast, deep hole, and it appears something inside is about to speak. However, the higher man interjects, assuring that he is aware, and addresses it as, Lord, expressing gratitude for its kindness. Nevertheless, it emits another hiss, insisting that it desires to consume wolf cubs. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button for more content. Feel free to leave a comment down below sharing your thoughts or suggestions. If you want to stay updated on all our latest uploads, click the notification bell icon. And hey, why not check out some of our other videos popping up on the screen right now? If you'd like to support the channel, you can do so by liking, sharing, and subscribing. It really means a lot, peace.